Welcome to the Planning Commission meeting. The meeting is been, being held via Zoom conference call due to the COVID-19 crisis. Members of the public may participate by following the instructions listed on the agenda. You may also view and listen to the meeting on live stream cable TV, Granicus, and YouTube. Following roll call during summary of hearing procedure, we will review how the public may provide comment during today's session. We will now take roll call. Bonilla here. Casey? Here. Caballero? Caballero? Cantrell, Cantrell, Garcia, here. Lord and Law, here. Montañez, here. Oliverio, here. Ornelas Wise, here. Torrance, here. And Young, here. All right. Let the record reflect that as of this moment. Commissioners Caballero and Control are absent. If they do attend, we will inform the public. Summary of hearing procedures. The procedure for this hearing is as follows. After the staff report, applicants and appellants may make a five minute presentation. City staff will call out names of the public who identify the items they want to speak on. You may identify yourself by the raise hand feature on Zoom, click star nine on your phone, or you may call 408 535-3505 or email planning support staff at sanjoseca.gov and identify your name, phone number, and what items you'd like to speak on. As your name is called, city staff will unmute you to speak. After we confirm your audio is working, your allotted time will begin. Each speaker will have two minutes. Speakers using a translator will have four minutes. After the public testimony, the applicant and appellant may make closing remarks for an additional five minutes. Planning commissioners may ask questions of the speakers. Response to commissioner questions will not reduce the speaker's time allowance. Staff will unmute the speaker to respond to the commissioner. The public hearing will then be closed and the planning commission will take action on the item. The planning commission may request staff to respond to the public testimony, ask staff questions and discuss the item. If you challenge these land use decisions in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at this public hearing or in written correspondence 
delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. Planning Commission's actions on rezonings, prezonings, general plan amendments, and code amendments is only advisory to the City Council. The City Council will hold public hearings on these items. Section 20.120.400 of the, of the Municipal Code provides the procedures for legal protest to the City Council on rezonings and prezonings. The Planning Commission's actions on conditional use permits is appealable to the City Council in accordance with Section 220.100.220 of the Municipal Code. With that, we'll now go to item one, call to order, orders of the day. All right, item two, public comment. And this is public comment only for items that are not on the agenda. Again, let me repeat, only for items that are not on the agenda. Staff, do we have any public comment? I'm seeing a few hands, Chair. Okay. So let's let's confirm that these are for items not on the agenda. All right. Can we can we begin public comment? Am, am I live? Thank you. I was okay. Just so okay. Should be Hi, this is Jill Borders. I'm a District 10 resident and I was at this uh, meeting last two weeks ago. I'm here again to ask you to um, consider denying the project that will come before you on June 8th. I, um, it's known as the Gersh Gershwind Residence Project. Uh, this has been going on since March of 2017 and I'm very, very hopeful that after you look through all the documents and you consider the early denial letter and the fact that inside of that denial letter discusses the wildlife corridor um, issue and why they wanted to deny it then and how now that has not been solved for that it would be my number one. Um, it's quite blatantly obvious that they haven't solved for that issue. And so um, I'd like you to take that into consideration as you move forward. I also want to let you know that I have emailed the Environmental Services Department and not yet gotten a response. I emailed about a week ago. Um, I anticipate everyone is just so busy and understaffed, so I'll try again. But it's in regards to the question of um, all electrification in our new developments. Any new residents that we have, we want to be built with electrification. Um, and yet this particular proposal is saying that they will put a propane tank on the property and that is the energy source they will use and so i am hopeful that that will be something that will be discussed and whether or not we um, are willing to have a propane tank on this open hillside and if that's a good idea or not considering that the entire city has moved forward with um, all new buildings being electrified the next question i have is i really hope that you will consider the fact that this particular person has a 1400 foot driveway that'll go up along this hill if it's passed and i have a question it's 4400 square foot home with a 1400 square foot driveway it sounds more like a hotel to me a really nice airbnb are we going to allow an airbnb on an open hillside um, are we going to allow that person to run it that way and have 15 cars along that driveway? I have real serious concerns about the wildlife. And last, please look into this. It had a general planned open space, land, uh, open space park lands designation, and now they're telling me that was an error. So, confusion. Right, before we go on to the next public comment, uh, Commissioner Caballero uh, is stuck as an attendee. We need to convert her over as a panelist. Can we go ahead and make that happen? There she is. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Next public comment. Andrew, you should be unmuted. You know, hello. Yeah, this is Andrew Machoda. I uh, spoke last time as well, uh, as well as Jill Border, uh, regarding the, C the uh, a conditional use permit CP17-010, which will come before the board, the commission on June 8th. I just wanted to kind of point out some issues in, in, in addition to the environmental concerns. San Jose's municipal ordinance title 20 says the planning commission may issue a conditional use permit only after finding that the permit is consistent with the general plan and would further the policies of the general plan, which this permit will not. It also states a conditional use permit can only be approved if the proposal will not adversely affect the peace, health, safety, and welfare of the people living and working in the surroundings. 
I want to, last time I talked about the septic system runoff and the runoff from the land and into the community garden. Tonight I'm going to talk about that over 85% of the neighboring residents oppose this permit. The driveway that uh, Ms. Borders just mentioned enters Santa Teresa Bar, uh, Boulevard on a hillside with a blind spot to the south. It's where Santa Teresa Bo uh, Boulevard goes from four lanes to two lanes. So permitting the driveway here is a dangerous for traffic along Santa, Santa Teresa Boulevard. It will increase the odds of a vehicle vehicle accident. The driveway is also next to the uh, Coyote Altamos Canal, where it goes under Santa Teresa Boulevard and is acting as a wildlife underpass. Permitting the driveway would allow would divert animals from the underpass onto Santa Teresa Boulevard, increasing the risk of uh, animal vehicle accidents. The general plan in Chapter 5 limits the use of property outside the urban growth boundary to that, those having very little impact on the land, minimal visibility from the valley floor, and will not result in substantial direct or indirect impacts on sensitive habitat areas. The, even the owner of the property admits this house will be visible from the valley floor. And, and the general plan also and it impacts the wildlife. Uh, I also kind of want to uh, point out that in chapter six, it states that properties with slopes greater than 30% are typically ridgelines and need special protection. If my trigonometry is correct, where the house is going to be built is over 30%. Uh, next speaker, please. Dave, you should be able to speak. Good evening, Dave Pochel, resident of San Jose. I too want to alert you to the concerns about the project on the ridge that forms the northern border of Coyote Valley that will be before you at your next meeting. Please take a close look at the letters you will receive from the environmental organizations, the expert biological opinion from Pathways for Wildlife, the legal opinion from Bard Kaufman explaining why CEQA requires an EIR for this project. So what's the big deal about just one house? Let me explain. Since the initial study does not, which is why we need a deeper assessment, it could have a significant environmental impact on the entire region. Pathways for Wildlife, the research consultants used by the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority to study wildlife movement in and around Coyote Valley has identified this very specific site as critical for the wildlife linkage between the large habitats of the Diablo Range and the Santa Cruz Mountains needed to maintain genetic diversity of the wildlife populations. For example, studies show that the existence of mountain lions in the Santa Cruz Mountains is already threatened by health issues due to inbreeding. So what's the impact of one house? Picture an hourglass with the top and bottom chambers as these large habitats. This site is that pinch point in the middle. If you clog it, you lose the flow and hence the whole functioning of the hourglass is lost. They identified only two wildlife passages available to cross Santa Teresa Boulevard. And one is the culvert at the uh, canal at this site. Uh, have you ever seen a mountain lion in person? Like me, probably not. But if you've hiked our hills, they have seen, heard, and smelled you. They avoid human contact and activity, including cars, lights, and noise. I'm not asking that you take my word. I'm asking that you require EIR levels of study as CEQA requires, but that the NMD fails to provide. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right, with that, do uh, we have any more public comment, Ian? Donna, you should be able to speak. My name is Donna Ewan. I'm from the Baker West Neighborhood Association. I have major concerns about the traffic gridlock that will be created by the El Paseo project. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to stop you there. This is public comment only for items not on the agenda. You will have an opportunity to comment uh, when that item uh, comes up on the agenda. So my apologies for that. Okay. Yeah. And do we have any other public comment? Looks okay. like that's all, Sharon. Right. Seeing none, I will then go ahead, close public comment, and now move on to item three, deferrals and removals from calendar. Staff, are we still consistent? Nothing to defer, nothing to remove? Is that still, still accurate? That is correct. Nothing to defer or remove. All right. Perfect. We'll go ahead and move on to item four, the, the consent calendar. Uh, we got a motion on the floor to approve items A, B, and C as a package. Motion to approve the consent calendar. All right, motion to approve, uh, motion made by Commissioner Torrance. We have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Oliverio. I'll go ahead and take a roll call vote. Uh, Bonilla, I will abstain. I was absent uh, for that meeting. Uh, Casey? Yes. Caballero? Yes. Uh, Cantrell? Yes. Still absent. Okay, Garcia? Yes. Lord Noir? Yes. 
One thing, yes. Yes. Oliverio? Yes. Cornelis Wise? Yes. Torrance? Yes. Young? Yes. All right, with that, the motion passes with Bonilla abstaining and uh, Cantrell being absent. Uh, Chair, quick question. Was that on, on the entire consent calendar or just item 3A? Uh, uh, the entire consent calendar. There were a couple of hands up, so I don't know if you wanted to entertain if there were any items that were going to get pulled. Yeah, no, they're, they're not. We're, we're moving. Uh, we've approved the entire consent calendar. All right. With that, we are now at the public hearing. Staff, tell me when you're ready for me to start. Okay, so we'll go ahead and begin public hearing item 5A, PC, PDC 19-049 and PD 20-006. Staff, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Alec Atienza, uh, Planning, with the Department of Planning, Building and Code Enforcement. Let me just pull my slides up quick. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, let's go full screen. Again, Alec Atienza, I have with me Myra Blanco. We're both from the planning division. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, before you this evening is the El Paseo and 1777 Saratoga Avenue mixed use signature project. Just as a little bit of context, we're gonna go over the location. So. This site is located on both the north and southeast sides of the intersection of Saratoga Avenue, Lawrence Expressway, and Quito Road. It consists of the partial redevelopment of a portion of the El Paseo de Saratoga Shopping Center, as well as the complete redevelopment of the buildings located at 1777 Saratoga Avenue. In terms of the project components, so this project includes a rezoning from both the CG commercial general and CP commercial pedestrian zoning districts to a CG planned development zoning district. Uh, that rezoning would support an associated planned development permit, which would allow the demolition of approximately 126,000 square feet of existing commercial space and the removal of 120 trees. That would facilitate the construction of four mixed use buildings that includes 994 residential units, approximately 165,000 square feet of commercial space, 3.5 acres of publicly accessible open space, including 1.1 acre public park. Uh, additionally, the project includes a conditional use, conditional use permit and determination of public convenience and necessity for off-sale alcohol at a future grocery store within building three. Uh, and then lastly, the project includes extended construction hours from between 6 and 9 a.m. over a 15 day period, which would allow concrete pours for the construction of the subterranean parking garage. In terms of the project review, uh, this project was initially submitted in December of 2019, and it was reviewed for consistency with the general plan, uh, more specifically the signature project policy, which is policy IP 5.10. Uh, that signature project policy allows housing projects to proceed ahead of the preparation of an urban village plan if it meets the criteria of that policy. Uh, so this subject site is located within the El Paseo de Saratoga urban village. Uh, it has a land use designation of both the neighborhood community commercial and regional commercial. The project provides its fair share of jobs and housing within the urban village. It's located at a highly visible intersection, the intersection of Saratoga, Lawrence, and Quito. Uh, and it incorporates both public and publicly accessible open space. Um, additionally, the project included extensive public outreach, both among the city as well as the developer. Uh, and in addition to the signature project policy, one of the key components that I mentioned previously is that the project includes a planned development zoning district uh, to support the development of the signature project. So this plan development zoning district includes specifically tailored development standards, which include height, setback, uh, allowable density, as well as building configurations. 
Uh, in addition, the zoning district would allow for the administrative permitted special and conditional uses of the urban village zoning district, which aligns with the signature project criteria. Uh, lastly, the project was also reviewed for consistency with the applicable additional applicable provisions of the municipal zoning code, as well as the residential design guidelines, city council policy 6-30 for public outreach, as well as the California Environmental Quality Act. And to discuss that key component, CEQA, I have Myra Blanco here. Myra, take it away. Thank you, Alec. Good evening, commissioners, members of the public, city staff. Uh, my name is Myra Blanco and I am the environmental project manager with the city of San Jose here to um, provide information regarding the environmental review for the subject project. The city of San Jose prepared an environmental impact report for the 1312 and 1777 Saratoga Avenue mixed use village project in compliance with the requirements of CEQA and the CEQA statutes and guidelines. The first step in the preparation of an EIR is the publication of a notice of preparation or NOP. The NOP for this project was publicly circulated for 30 days from September 28, 2020 to October 27, 2020 in accordance with section 15082 of the CEQA guidelines. The NOP provided a general description of the proposed project and identified possible environmental impacts that could result from implementation of the project. The City of San Jose also held a public scoping meeting on October 5, 2020 to discuss the project and solicit public input as to the scope and contents of the EIR. Comments received during the NOP circulation period were considered in the preparation of the draft environmental impact report. Once the draft was completed, a notice of completion and notice of availability were filed electronically with the state's Office of Planning and Research. The Notice of Availability, or NOA, of the draft EIR was published on October 15, 2021, and that started a 45-day public circulation period from October 15, 2021 through November 29, 2021. The NOA was publicized by filing it with the County Recorder's Office and the State Clearinghouse, publishing it on the San Jose Post Record and Mercury News, posting it on the City's Environmental Review page, and the city's news flash page and emailing it to interested parties from the current notification list and the NOP commenters list above and beyond CEQA's notification requirements set forth in section 15087 in the CEQA statute and guidelines. Two project options, that is the education mixed use option and non-education mixed use option were analyzed in the EIR. The non-education mixed use option is the applicant's preferred project as reflected in the PD zoning and the PD permit before you this evening. The EIR did not identify significant and unavoidable impacts under either project, but the EIR did identify significant impacts to air quality, biological resources, hazardous materials, noise and transportation traffic. These impacts would be reduced to a less than significant level with identified uh, mitigation measures. The impacts as well as the mitigation measures are outlined in the associated mitigation monitoring and reporting program that is also part of the hearing documents packet. Um, during the 45-day public review and comment period, staff received more than 70 comments on the draft EIR. Many of the comments received during the public circulation period raised similar concerns and questions, so topic responses were prepared as part of the first amendment to respond to these um, topics globally. The topic responses address vehicle miles traveled, which is the CEQA metric for transportation impacts, the, the project's obligations regarding below market housing, impacts to utilities, parking, schools, aesthetics and visual impacts, as well as general plan consistency, project density and scale. The first amendment to the draft EIR was posted to the city's active EIR project website on May 6, 2022, which is consistent with section 15088 of the CEQA statutes and guidelines, which states that the lead agency provide a response at least 10 days prior to the, cert prior to the certification of the environmental impact report. All commenters were sent a notice of the first amendment's availability via email. 
Following its publication, staff issued an errata memo, which outlines minor revisions and additions to the transportation traffic mitigation measure. The errata memo was provided with the hearing documents and made available to all commenters on the project's environmental review page. As part of the EIR process, um, alternatives were identified to the proposed project, a total of six alternatives were considered and three were evaluated further. Um, as stated earlier, staff responded to the comments and questions within the first amendment and none of the comments raised represent new significant information that would warrant recirculation of the draft EIR pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15088.5. Therefore, the first amendment together with the draft environmental impact report constitute the final environmental impact report for the uh, El Paseo 1777 Saratoga Avenue Mixed Use Village project. Um, this concludes the presentation for the environmental review. Thank you for that. Do we have more staff or is that just the environmental review presentation? That was just the environmental review. I, I'll okay. just add my last little piece here. Um, just okay. the staff recommendation, but that's it. I believe Eric is here to provide the presentation. I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, so that concludes your presentation? Yes. Perfect. All right, thank you for that. Uh, now we will uh, give the floor to the applicant. Yen, can you move over Eric Shainauer, Allison Koo, and Ken Rodriguez, please? Right now, all eyes are on you, Alec, <laughs> literally. <laughs> yeah. This is Eric. None of our none of our group was promoted till now. So uh, give us one second. Allison is starting the presentation. And so if we can share screen with Allison when she comes up. What was the third name there, Eric? Uh, Alex? Uh, Ken Rodriguez. Allison Ku and Ken Rodriguez. I see Allison is on. And I see Ken. So if we can share screen with Allison, she'll be uh, moving the slides for us. Please. Uh -huh. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. Great. All right. We ready? Are you ready on our side? Yes. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, my name is Allison Koo, and I represent the ownership of El Paseo. We're a locally based company that looks to approach projects with a long term perspective in mind, hence, our focus on quality and uh, close community relationships. Thank you, Chair Bonilla and Vice Chair Casey, as well as the fellow commission members tonight. And thank you to staff for the hard work in getting us to this point. And finally, thank you to the community members for attending and providing valuable feedback at the over 40 meetings we've had in the last three years. That input has played a large role in helping design and refine the project, including the elimination completely of the school educational use, including a 100% publicly accessible park, protecting, preserving, and enhancing a landscape berm that will serve as a buffer to our neighbors, and securing a grocery anchor for the project, Whole Foods. We're extremely proud of the project that we're presenting tonight and look forward to delivering the new community gathering place for D1 and the West Side. And good evening, I'm Eric Shainauer, land use consultant to the project. These are the key features of the design. Number one, the project meets or exceeds all signature project requirements in the Envision 2040 general plan, including commercial job space, high, high residential density, adequate publicly accessible open space, extensive community engagement, and high quality architecture, landscape, and site design. Two, we will buy we will expand commercial space by creating a total of 165,000 square feet of commercial space, 
a Whole Foods grocery store will anchor the central main street that will include both retail and office space. Third, the project will construct 150 units of affordable housing on site, in addition to the, the 844 market rate units. Fourth, the project includes a total of 3.5 acres of publicly accessible outdoor space, including a 1.1 acre public park and 2.4 acres of pedestrian paseos, urban plazas, and outdoor dining along the main street. And finally, fifth, we will construct new wider sidewalks, crosswalks, and bike lanes to promote walking and biking instead of car travel. The project is reducing parking by 6.1%, and all parking is hidden from view, either underground or within structures. I'll now hand it to our lead architect, Ken Rodriguez. Good evening, my name is Ken Rodriguez, and uh, I'm gonna walk through the site plan very quickly. Um, not only are we providing this new project that both Allison and, and Eric just talked about, we're also enhancing a pedestrian promenade, new pedestrian promenade in front of the existing shops, uh, AMC, REI, and such. This will be running from uh, West Campbell Avenue, um, westerly along the entire face of those shops. We've eliminated some parking, created new walkways, benches, and landscape features that will tie into the project right at REI. And then as a continuation of that promenade, we are creating a new main street within the project that um, runs both east and west, north and south. The north and south connection hook up to Saratoga and the south direction hooks up to a new public park that will be located down in the left-hand side of this site plan uh, at Quito Road. Let's go to the next slide, if we could, please. Um, this is a rendering uh, of Main Street, the connection right after um, uh, REI. So it's facing from REI looking west into the project. As you can see, we've created a lot of outdoor uh, character, outdoor dining, retail shops that line the Main Street. Um, these, this, uh, this particular Main Street is really oriented to pedestrians and bicycles, as well as uh, community functions that will happen here. Um, our anchor uh, grocery store, Whole Foods, will be using this a few times a year to promote uh, outdoor um, uh, sales activities and uh, community gathering and functions. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a view looking at Whole Foods with their outdoor dining area that will be located all along Main Street. Um, outdoor seating, table, connection, um, and then entrances to the building would be located here. You can see the residential uh, projects up above, which are stepped back from uh, the Main Street architecture with its uh, unique lighting and pedestrian bicycle connections uh, all along the Main Street area. Next slide. So this slide is at the elbow of Main Street. If you were to walk to the left on this slide, you would walk directly into the new uh, public park. If you were to walk to the right, you'll get to the north connection that connects up to Saratoga. As you can see in the foreground, uh, again, unique outdoor table seating, gathering spots for different retail tenants that line the entire ground floor of this project. It is very commercial, retail oriented. Um, and the only thing that touches the ground besides, or the, uh, that are on the ground floor besides the uh, 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 retail restaurant use are the lobbies that are entering into the residential towers above, which you can see uh, up on the second level with deep recessed uh, decks, uh, landscaping that tears down from uh, uh, some of those decks, uh, unique architecture in terms of sandblasted concrete material, clear glass, balconies, uh, a project that really orients itself down to the public uh, uh, main street and back up to uh, the decks and, and to the art. Mr. Rodriguez, the, and, and thank you for that. that that'll, that concludes the initial five minutes for the applicant. Uh, I will then thank you, Chair. go ahead now and, no, no, of course. And, and I will now go ahead and open up the public comment. I wanna make sure that everyone is heard and I also wanna give the commission time to deliberate. So I will limit public comment to one minute. Uh, with that, go ahead again and start public comment. And 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 again, if we can keep time, that'd be great. Thank you. 
the organization Catalyze can unmute themselves. Waiting for you to switch the public comment time. Good evening, my name is Alex Shore. I'm the executive director of Catalyze SV. Our members have been involved in this project for a long time and have some good feedback for you on how to make this project as good as possible. Hoping it gets approved by the Planning Commission tonight with potentially some improvements that our members have suggested. You're gonna hear a lot of comment tonight about the EIR and this project's impact on the city. I would suggest that if we as a community really truly care about the environment, we would build projects using sustainable materials that are more energy efficient by being taller, with as little parking as possible, emphasizing walking, biking, and public transit, and with lots of green space. That's what our members really care about and will be talking about. So as planning commissioners, I hope you'll keep your eye on the prize of what it means to truly build sustainable development for everyone. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Amy, you should be able to speak. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Tara Vanilla and Planning Commission members, my name is Amy Cody and I'm president of the Moreland West Neighborhood Association. The project is, a, is of great concern to our community due to its traffic impacts and the nearly 2,000 new residents who may seek out the bits of green space surrounding Moreland Middle School, which is the closest thing we have to a park. We reached out to the developer nearly three years ago. We've reviewed proposals, provided input, and organized two special meetings to help our neighbors stay informed through project changes. It's been a challenge. There are long periods when we were told to wait for the new proposal or wait for the response to comments on the DEIR. For many months, we couldn't refer neighbors to the city's website because the project summary, photo, and project manager information were outdated. Project presentations have not been adequate at the community meeting Held this past January, the developer showed a single building elevation, the shortest one, and left out elevations for the three tallest buildings. We've repeatedly requested for visual for visuals that show all four buildings that have not seen this. And finally, sign Mark, Mark, you can go ahead and speak. Yeah, this is Mark Grimsey. Thank you very much. My wife and I are longtime residents of Baker West and we are within 500 feet of this proposal. Um, we believe that the traffic mitigations are insufficient for the 900 plus residential units and over 2,200 residents. Um, we, don't we, we do not consider San Jose transportation infrastructure or other projects within one mile of this as part of this. We believe that the mitigations, the traffic calming, only half of that would be reached and the other half would be reached toward the target. The other half would be for non-enforceable behaviors. We believe that the Planning Commission should return this project back to the developer recommendations to reduce density, building height, so the traffic mitigations are truly possible and not based on human behaviors. We also understand that the multi, uh, multi-modal transportation improvement plan for West San Jose is, does not include this project. John, you can go ahead. My name is John Oberstar. I'm a resident of Baker West, adjacent to the site, and I'm concerned about the quality or the validity of the traffic analysis supporting the project. For instance, the report contained a factual error on the status of the metering lights on the Saratoga North 85 ramp. It also states that out of 1,100 residences, there will only be 219 new outbound trips at the peak AM commute hour. If you assume one and a half residents per unit, that means 15% commute at the peak AM hour. Or if you use the number the city quoted, 2263, only 10% of the residents are commuting out in the peak AM hour. Furthermore, the DERR resp response stated that out of those 219 trips, only one would use the Saratoga ramp at northbound 85. I found this highly questionable and raised it with the city and was told that the report assumes northbound 85 entrance ramp would be used, which was not in the scope of the analysis and is further away. Mike, you can go ahead. This is Mike Thompson. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear I'd you. Like to talk about the uh, 
the Alpha Sale Phase One Talking Point One that we have Moreland West has sent to you. The average I looked at the average salaries for the cashiers and checkers of Safeway, Knob Hill, Whole Foods, and Costco, and their annual salary is about thirty-four thousand dollars. The mail carrier and McDonald's in the nearby area, their annual salary is thirty-eight thousand dollars. The rental for a two-bedroom apartment is about thirty-one thousand dollars per year. So I'm recommending that the 15% of the affordable projects be set at the 50% AMI so that all of the Costco clerks, handlers, and whatnot can afford to live in the project. And also the commercial property, 195000 does not comply with the Urban Village guidelines and intentions. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara, you can go ahead and unmute. Hi, my name is Barbara Gaylord and I'm a resident of the Baker West neighborhood. I am here to ask that you look at the comprehensive plan of the entire 30 acre site, not just the 10.7 acre piece of the phase one El Paseo plan. The San Jose 2040 general plan updated on December 21 and amended in March of 22, targets 919 dwelling units from the entire El Paseo urban village. The current phase one is calling for 994 dwelling units on just this 10.7 acres of the village. So the phase one plan meets the housing unit target for the entire urban village on just 10% of the village acreage and on only one third of the 30 acre El Paseo shopping center site. We believe the residential density at 92 dwelling units per acre is too high. I request that the number of resident units be significantly reduced while maintaining the 149 units of affordable housing. I would also like the city to share the housing and commercial targets of the remaining One, you should be able to unmute. Yes, uh, I'm Luann Abrahams from uh, the Moreland West neighborhood. Uh, from the outset, uh, the neighbors have expressed our concerns about the high project density, building heights, neighborhood compatibility, traffic impact, school impact, the lack of affordable housing in our area. And while the uh, developers did meet with us many times, uh, we were shown an array of shifting projects. We uh, did not see our actual concerns addressed and none of the major concerns have been addressed at all. And what we are left with is a project that will set the tone for future development in this underdeveloped area with a forest of towers ranging up to 11 and 12 stories of height, which is completely out of scale. We are concerned about affordable housing and we want to have those affordable units. However, this project maximizes the number of market rate units while doing only the minimum percentage of affordable housing. Thank you, Luann. Gary, you can go ahead. We can't hear you, Gary, you're on mute. Thank you. Gary Cunningham, Moreland West Neighborhood Association. We do not believe the El Paseo phase one proposal meets council policy to promote job growth, to fix San Jose's job and housing imbalance, and will continue to contribute to a rising city operating services budget. The densities for residential units and commercial and office space do not compare well to the 50 acre site, Valco and Cupertino, nor to the way comparable 10 acre approved San Jose project Stevens Creek Promenade, which is on the 4300 block of Stevens Creek. El Paseo phase one residential density is approximately two times higher than Valco and approximately 1.5 times higher than Stevens Creek Promenade. El Paseo phase one commercial space density is approximately three times lower than Valco and approximately two times lower than Stevens Creek Promenade. We do not believe the El Paseo phase one proposal it's the best for the city in terms of addressing revenue. Bob, you can go ahead and unmute. Good evening, my name is Bob Levy. I'm a D1 resident and former San Jose Planning Commissioner and Parks Commissioner. I strongly recommend that this project be sent back to the drawing board. The project is far, far too dense for the area. This kind of development is appropriate for a downtown or transit rich area. The site is served by two bus routes 
with stops every 15 and 30 minutes. This project is an auto-oriented development with no transit options. Placing 11 and 12 story buildings in an area predominantly one and two story buildings is inappropriate. The neighborhood appreciates the need for housing and is interested in a project with six and eight story buildings, not 11 and 12. The project does not rise to the level of being an exceptional signature project. Based on the city pro a policy providing three acres of parkland for every 1,000 residents, the project should be providing six acres of parkland, not a measly 1.2. There's virtually no recreational attributes in the project. And the Baker West neighborhood, which, which is adjacent, has not a single park. This makes the situ that situation far worse. Roberto, you can go ahead. Hello, thank you. My name is Roberta Witte. I live in English Estates, which is very close by. We do not believe the proposed new structure of the El Paseo Phase 1 are consistent with or complementary to the surrounding neighborhood fabric as required by Community Development Policy CD 4.9. For reference, some large structures nearby, the four-story Apple Headquarters in Cupertino, the seven-story Kaiser Hospital in Lawrence, the eight-story residence at Santana Row, and newly developed seven and eight-story buildings at the Stevens Creek Promenade Project in San Jose. Baker West and Moreland West Neighborhood Associations have been in support of site development, but have repeatedly expressed concerns about the size and heights of the buildings. I in English Estates also support it. I live in an area with a nursing home and a two-story apartment building. El Paseo Phase 1 plans have not adequately considered the resident input on building heights and densities and do not well adjust it. Matt, you can go ahead. Good evening, Chair Bonilla, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Matt Regan with the Bay Area Council. We represent about 300 of the region's largest employers. We are in full support of this project. We've reviewed it. It meets all the requirements of smart growth, dense infill, transit-oriented development. Um, I would point you to Lathrop in, in the Central Valley, where there's a, the largest development in the state, currently 12,000 single-family homes. And there's a billboard on the freeway next to that development that says a short commute to Silicon Valley. That development is possible because we are not building infill housing next to jobs in our urban cores. That is why this project and projects like it are so vital to meet our climate uh, goals, to meet our societal goals, to meet our equity goals. This is a good project. It's not a perfect project. It will never satisfy the opponents. There has never been a project that does not have opponents. But it's a good project, and we urge your support. Thank you. Sarah, you can go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sarah Cardona. I'm the Deputy Director at Greenbelt Alliance. We're an environmental nonprofit. And after a careful review, Greenbelt Alliance is pleased to endorse the proposed El Paseo de Saratoga project. We believe this is a tremendous proposal. It would represent 994 new units, 149 of which are designated below market rate and located on site by incorporating 3.5 acres of open space, community retail, much needed housing. This is truly a vibrant mixed use town center with community gathering spaces where employees, residents, guests, a lot of people can comfortably and safely enjoy and walk within the project. Uh, we believe this would play a pivotal role in reimagining a more resilient and inclusive San Jose for all residents to enjoy. And we're proud to give this project our endorsement. We hope its approval tonight will inspire cities around the Bay Area to redouble their efforts to grow smartly. Thank you. Lala, you can go ahead and unmute. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. My name is Lalo Mendez, and I'm the Project Development Specialist for Cadillac SV. I'm here to voice the support of our members for this bicycle and pedestrian oriented uh, project. We scored this project in 2020 and later in 2021. And so one of the things that our members really want to highlight was the community engagement. This is an applicant who's been engaged from the very beginning and who's been um, receptive to our members' feedback. Uh, four recommendations to make this uh, an even better project. We, our members recommended the inclusion of more bicycle slots with thousands of new residents. We believe that a one-to-one -one parking ratio is adequate. Uh, this to connect the residents to larger transit options. Uh, second, to provide uh, transit passes to incentivize the residents uh, to use those alternative modes of transportation. And third is to increase the number of electrical vehicle charging stations. This is imperative as we move forward. And lastly, the project meets um, uh, LED 
sustainability standards. However, our members want to see a much, much aggressive approach and see the project pursue LED gold or even platinum. So hopefully you take our... And you can go ahead. Uh, I'm Paul. I'm a resident of uh, uh, Moreland West uh, uh, neighborhood. According to the plan of the El Pesosa, there are 1.7 acre of uh, publicly accessible open space around the buildings. It's where people gather, but it, it includes the travel lanes of the main street section, along with about the 30 plus uh, parking spot. I question if uh, this is an appropriate uh, definition of a uh, public accessible uh, open space. It also includes uh, outdoor seating for uh, restaurants and I question how publicly accessible that is. This area is known for its uh, lack of uh, public parks. Our neighborhood has no park. On page uh, 77 of the First Amendment uh, to the DEIR response to comments, it says uh, the project would generate uh, 2,263 new residents. Well, reading the San Jose Park Impact uh, ordinance, uh, uh, my understanding is that uh, 3,000 plus residents would require six uh, acres of uh, parkland. The current plan of 3.5 acres is both a private and a public open space and park. So sh well short. Ron, you should be able to unmute. Hi, Ron Kuhn from Baker West. El Paseo phase one building heights and densities have been raised as major resident concerns since early, the earliest meetings with developers. These were acknowledged as areas of no controversy in the draft impact report. Despite these resident concerns, the building heights and densities have increased. Due to development plan changes, the project's commercial space decreased from 400,000 square feet to 165 square feet. However, despite the decrease in project commercial space, the three shortest buildings have increased from seven, seven and nine stories to nine, 10 and a half and 11 stories. And the number of residents increased from 741 units to 994 units. Thank you. Donna, please unmute yourself. Yes, I'm Donna Ewan from Baker West. The traffic mitigations are not sufficient for 994 residential units for the Alpha Sale site and do not consider the 876 additional cars for the Costco warehouse project at Delta. There are also developments at the Quito Village project at Saratoga Avenue and Cox and a possible 10 story residential development at Lawrence Expressway and Prospect Avenue. All these developments are within one mile of the El Paseo phase one. I have a concern about the validity of the traffic analysis report, as John Orbister mentioned, which says that during peak AM hours, there'll be 219 new outbound trips by residents, which means assuming there's only one or 1.5 residents per unit, only a 14 to 20% of residents will be commuting at peak hours. We find these traffic numbers to be highly unlikely and we request prior to rezoning and permit approval that the city of San Jose collaborate with the city of Saratoga, Santa Clara County and regional transit authorities to perform an independent transit study and consider all the other developments. Gary, please unmute yourself. Yes, hi, um, honorable planning commissioners, Gary Smith. Um, representative of the English Estates neighborhood uh, just uh, north of Prospect High School. And um, I would like to reiterate the, the prior speaker's uh, points about the, um, well, the Saratoga Corners, which is, um, which is a mixed use uh, residential within the triangle uh, of where the 1777 um, El Paseo project. So this is phase one. And planning commissioners, I ask you to utilize your strength, utilize your power. Um, this this coalition, we're, we're only asking you to, um, what, limit the building heights to eight stories or not throughout the whole project. That will reduce the, the number of units, yes, the, uh, uh, the housing units. But okay, let's increase the number of affordable housing units. But let's consider the whole thing, the Saratoga potential, with their new housing development and the Costco, please plan. Alex, please unmute yourself. 
Uh, hello, Planning Commission. My name is Alex Melendrez. I am the Organizing Manager at EMB Action. Uh, I cover the South Bay chapter. Uh, yesterday, I was at the City Council where the City of San Jose designated May as Affordable Housing Month. And I can't think of another project that kind of exemplifies uh, the opportunity to create much needed affordable uh, homes. It has 994 homes. It's going to have 149 uh, deed restricted affordable housing. It's going to be a climate friendly proposal. And I really think if the city of San Jose wants to live up to its expectation of uh, creating an abundant uh, housing situation for San Jose, an inclusive San Jose, this is an exemplary project. We heard a lot of concerns earlier, but what I heard was just delay, delay, delay. You're not going to get those badly needed homes if you uh, delay or cut back the level of housing uh, or the project as presented. Please move it forward. Ali, please unmute yourself. Good evening, Chair Bonilla and fellow commissioners. My name is Ali Saperman, and I'm here in part on behalf of the Housing Action Coalition. I've shared with the commission our formal letter of endorsement, as well as letters of support from San Jose residents and members of pro-housing organizations. What you'll hear tonight is that all groups who aim to address our housing crisis believe that El Paseo is an incredible use of land space, will bring 994 much needed homes to this resource rich area. You've heard a lot from residents tonight, who are mostly wealthy homeowners, but you also hear from a resident who is a renter. Beyond my role at Hack, I am first and foremost speaking as a San Jose resident, as a District 1 constituent, and a neighbor of El Paseo in the Hathaway neighborhood. I'm a renter in a rent control department, and I'm speaking in enthusiastic support of El Paseo. This project will create new homes uh, with 149 deed restricted. My only critique of the project is that the building height should be much taller so that we can include more units for people like me to enjoy the incredible amenities of this area of District 1 has to offer. Thank you so much, and I urge you to support the project without any delay. Thank you so much. Stephen, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Stephen Jameson. I'm here on behalf of Whole Foods, and I'd like to urge the Planning Commission to please move this forward. Whole Foods is looking for certainty and the ability to open up and to provide groceries and beverages with these seasonal events the periodic tastings events, and all the unique foods that Whole Foods is known for uh, in this wonderful, wonderful, wonderfully designed project. We're excited to be there. We'd like to see it move forward as quickly as possible. The design of the project allows engagement with the community, the farmer's market, periodic tastings, and to explore the new and unique beer, wines, and distilled spirits. Whatever can be done to expedite the development, and this uh, and to provide certainty so that we can know when to join this community would be greatly appreciated. And we thank you for your efforts and for your time. Thank you. Eric, please unmute yourself. My name is Eric Deringer, I'm a resident of Baker West. Um, I had a question at the last committee related to uh, infrastructure, uh, mostly related to children. I, was curious if there was a plan being shared of the expected number of children that would have to go to nearby schools and how the schools would uh, take that new capacity. Uh, the response I was given was related to a decline in enrollment, which didn't really answer the question of whether or not the schools can have capacity to support, and if not, what the plan is to build that capacity. Um, the second item was related to parking. Um, I think the parking number isn't currently listed, but in the past it seemed insufficient for 994 units and what the plan was for parking overflow. Uh, the near neighborhood is not only not the closest walk for the new residents, but um, it doesn't seem to be an appropriate solution for overflow in the neighborhood um, to become you know, the actual solution. So what's the plan for the number of parking units to support 2000 residents? I don't think a one-to-one -one ratio of uh, units to parking spots available 24 hours is, is adequate. Um, yeah, so those, if we can get a response on those two questions about kid capacity and parking capacity, that we appreciate it, because last time it was a non-answer. Phil, so please, please unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, this is Phil. I'm part of Baker West, that line that is adjacent to the berm uh, of the development. Um, I spoke before about the, um, the traffic passage to the parking garage that's on the south side that runs behind the buildings, existing buildings. Well, I'm concerned that with the density and the amount of parking that's going into that garage, it will become another thoroughfare 
that hasn't been in, really considered in terms of uh, maybe the traffic considerations. It's just considered, you know, just a byway. Else, as well as I uh, share the concerns of the density. I'm excited about the project. I hope you can approve a project that has much lower densities that re that is part of the EIR's mitigation uh, recommendations. A lot of environmental impacts can be mitigated with lower densities, and I hope you look at that as a, a, a solution you can approve. Thank you. Catherine, please unmute yourself. Um, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Hedges. I'm a member of Catalyze SV. And I'm speaking in strong support of the El Paso Sarah Toga project. It accomplishes the stated goals of the city of San Jose and way very few other projects do. It will activate the and enhance the strip mall and parking lot with nearly a thousand new homes, including 149 affordable homes for San Jose residents like me who need them the most. You know, the city of San Jose has a housing crisis, a displacement crisis, and an affordability crisis. To solve it, we need high density projects like this that can deliver homes for people in resource rich areas that will serve residents. You know, I'd like to have amenities like a Trader Joe's and REI instead of open air drug sales where I live now. I urge you to move this project forward. Thank you. Vince, please unmute yourself. Vince, you're still on mute. Oh, sorry, I didn't know that. Uh, Vince Roche was the Vice President of Housing and Community Development with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. Uh, we endorse and support this project very strongly because it is a smart, climate smart, friendly mixed use development envisioned in the general plans urban village concept. People will be able to walk to shopping and retail and restaurants to reduce car trips. Also, building denser is the best thing we can do for our climate and our planet. It's gonna be near jobs and in a resource rich part of the city. I urge you to support this project this evening because it's the smart thing to do, the right thing to do, and it'll build much needed housing in the right place. Thank you. Carlin, please unmute yourself. Okay, uh, this is Carlin Black. I'm um, with uh, Catalyze SV volunteer and a former urban planner and all sorts of good things. This project must go forward. It should be taller than it is right now. Uh, Catalyze SV just last Monday did a program on mobility on demand and how that's gonna affect par parking and, and traffic. And that is not in the near, in the distant future. That is like uh, least, uh, end of this year, next year. So that you will see parking on demand. And there is also a possibility that um, glideways will build down Stevens Creek and include. Uh, this in the triangle and the tri triangle will be the new midtown for uh, San Jose. All right, before we start, I understand that we have a row of hands up of speakers that have already spoken. Um, can we clarify that? If you've already spoken, You've already spoken, and we have to leave it open for folks that have not had an opportunity to speak. Yes, we have John Obasta, Emmy Cody, Jill Bordes, they've already spoken. Okay, so we can take yeah. them out of the queue, and then that'll get us down to the remaining balance of folks that have not spoken. Rob, Roberta Wade. All right, so Robert Waite is our next speaker. Robert, you can go ahead. Oh, this is Roberta Witte. Oh, Roberta has already spoken. Roberta, sorry, sorry. Okay. Mohan, you can go ahead and speak. Oh, thank you very much for unmuting me. Uh, I'm really, really excited about the program that you're talking about it, you know. And I support 100% electrification. Uh, we are building net zero homes that we want to bring into the city. Our purpose is to mitigate the global warming and the climate change. In addition to that, 
you know, California has had a lot of fires and I got inspired to build these uh, properties and I'm in San Jose uh, from Paradise. So we developed the technology now to build completely fire resistant homes, you know. We do not use any lumber in them. And if I can be of any help to the city, I would really, really like to introduce this technology to all of you and uh, build affordable homes. We can build faster homes and we can finish these projects within three months uh, from start to finish. Thank you very much. Sitco Homes. To clarify, Jill did not speak. Uh, Jill, you can go ahead and unmute. Hi, thank you. I, I appreciate you noticing that I didn't speak on this item and I want to apologize. And Chair Bonilla, I hope I can ask for a point of privilege. Um, I emailed ahead of time of this meeting and asked if I would be able to speak on the consent calendar because I received a notice in the mail about the project. Um, item number B, I wanted to speak on item number A and item number B. Um, it's too late to spike in item number B. I'm sure the applicant is not there to ask questions of. May I just quickly comment on consent item A under consent calendar because I was told that I would be, have that chance to speak. Just respectfully, no, we're gonna, I'm sorry, the city attorney wants to weigh in, so we'll, we'll give him a chance to weigh in. Yes, uh, Chair Bonilla, I actually wanted to comment on that at the end of this item. Um, the individuals are permitted to speak on the consent calendar as required under the Brown Act. Um, it, it is something I was gonna raise after the conclusion of this item to revisit the consent calendar uh, so that individuals who are still on that want to speak can do so. Um, but um, Ms. Borders uh, is entitled to speak on the consent calendar. Um, and should be provided that opportunity at some point. So are you saying then that I can give her that opportunity at this point? Uh, you know, I, I'll defer to the chair on that one. I think uh, ultimately, I don't believe Ms. Borders was the only only individual that wanted to speak. Um, and I think it, it's prudent for the commission to go back and revisit the consent calendar. And there's also some items just in terms of the vote that we could clean up as well. So my suggestion would be to wait until uh, this item is done to revisit the consent calendar. Okay, well, I mean, in the future, I think we would have had this conversation ahead of time. I think we could, we could have avoided this. So here's what we'll do. Uh, Ms. Porter, since uh, council is telling me this for the first time uh, tonight, uh, that you can, we're just going to have to go ahead and keep this part of the meeting moving. We will revisit the consent calendar at the end of the meeting and give you your opportunity to speak there. Thank My you. apologies for that. I was not aware of that in council. Maybe we should have a conversation uh, offline uh, first time uh, if you've ever been provided that information. Sure. Okay, we will now go to the next public speaker. Jordan, please unmute. Yes, good evening, commissioners. Thank you so much for your time tonight. My name is Jordan Grimes and I'm an enthusiast an enthusiastic supporter of the El Paseo project, uh, specifically at the original heightened densities that were proposed. I think it's very important to discuss when, it, when we are discussing new housing, that we specifically center the people who cannot afford to live in our area, that we specifically center the people who are being priced out of San Jose and who are being priced out of the region at large. It's really important, and I don't think I've heard this mentioned tonight, that the latest uh, income statistics have been released for 2022, and area median income in San Jose is now more than uh, for a family of four is now more than $168,000. That is a direct result of the lack of housing that has been built in San Jose and this region as a whole. So I strongly support moving forward with this project tonight, and I hope you will uh, consider that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Individual named Neighbor One, please unmute. This is Neighbors for Intelligent Development. I'd like to talk about the road behind El Paseo. It's currently closed from 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. It has signs and a bollard at both ends. How is Sand Hill breaking this agreement? Number two, talking about the parcel at 1777 Saratoga Avenue. The two parcels are not contiguous. They are two separate projects not connected in any way but ownership. Sandhill said there is a pedestrian connection between the two sites. We do not see a pedestrian overpass or tunnel. Hence, there is no pedestrian connection. Therefore, it is not a signature project. It's definitely not pedestrian friendly to have to cross nine lanes of traffic on Saratoga Avenue. 
Number three, the parks. What happened to the 3.5 acre park? We gave up much more parkland than that for the low income housing project and the housing track that are across from Moreland School. It's the only, only district that gave up <coughs> this parkland for housing. Now it appears to be 1.1 acres. 0.6 acres is a sidewalk with two sides for homeless people in their tents. That means a half acre. That's not even enough for the people that live there. Also, what happened to the two minutes promise for speaking? We only got one. Kathy, please unmute yourself. Yes, this is Kathy from Baker West. And I'm with the others frustrated as uh, we only get a minute to speak. We have been really um, collaborating with the ownership and wanting the development. I also wanna just say that we also talk about a market rates. There is very little affordable housing in this, right? If we look, 850 residents is market rate. So all of the organizations that are talking about affordable housing, this is not the site for affordable housing. We would also like to know on the El Paseo phase one plans are not adequately considered and the residents input on the building heights, the densities, nor were they addressed on long-term jobs and the housing goals. We lack the visibility for the remainder of the El Paseo site and would recommend that you do eight stories and a traffic analysis. Thank you. M, please unmute yourself. Hi, I live within walking distance of the project. It doesn't even begin to fit our community. It, our community is old, open and airy. We have lots of greenery. I'd like you to preserve the 120 trees as we have to preserve ours as individuals, no matter what it costs. Limit the development, preferably to just commercial real estate, plus one story of residential since we're going there. Um, bring in, we need a minimum of two car spaces per pres residential unit plus commercial parking to reduce the conflict among the community members and jobs that pay um, more than low income wages. This is not the place for affordable housing. That would be down in town near all the services that support them, such as Sacred Heart. The mob, please unmute yourself. Um. Uh, I'm a resident of the Baker West, and I think uh, I, some project like this would be very, very nice for the community. But I think oh, the yeah. height concerns is definitely something that it like a 10 story building or a 12 story building would definitely not fit into the character of the neighborhood. So that that's the big concern I have. So you'd be good to restrict that to a smaller like age choice or something like that. Thank you for your, your comments. And if I read correct, oh, there's one more. Terry, please unmute yourself. Hi, uh, I used to live in that area, so I know it very well. And I've been um, uh, in the area for 30 years. And, and I know that um, when they built Santana Row, there was a lot of complaining about it being not fitting into the character of the neighborhood. But now we're all used to it. And we can't imagine any other kind of uh, structure in that area. And I think with time, people will get used to taller um, buildings in that area. It, they, it's, it's, I can easily imagine that the, what the plan is to fit nicely over time in that area. I think it could use some, uh, some uh, something modern in that area. Thank you. And with that, Paul will be our last comment since if I'm not mistaken, neighbor one has already spoken. Paul, well, you can go ahead and unmute. Hello, I'd just like to ask the Planning Commission to please restrict the building height to eight stories or less. I think if you do a quick calculation, um, if the building heights are roughly 60% of plan, you could still meet the housing density uh, requirements of San Jose. Um, as other people said, 
12 and 10 story buildings um, would basically completely change the neighborhood. Uh, we would go from a suburban like area, which all the local residents bought and contribute to, to a near downtown style living. Thank you. Chair, there are two more hands that I don't believe have spoken. Yeah, they have not spoken. Lisa, please unmute yourself. Hello, um, the Moreland West Neighborhood Association sought to has sought good planning and compromise from the beginning. We've supported the transit oriented pedestrian friendly urban village concept. We've advocated for density and eight story heights. We've asked for home ownership opportunities, supported affordable housing and suggested including more than 15% minimum affordable housing given the property density. We've advocated for more green space, jobs and inclusion of small businesses. The project ended up with, we, that we've ended up with though, however, is clearly oversized for the location, which lacks transit infrastructure, planning and investment. Alan, please unmute yourself. Hi, um, I'm a resident of Moreland West and I do support this doing a limit of eight stories. I'm very concerned about traffic uh, in this area, not just the adjacent traffic that's along Campbell Avenue and Saratoga there, but extended out to the other arteries of Lawrence and Saratoga Avenue where they intersect with 280. Those are just treacherous intersections with the traffic that's already there and it appears that the flow of, in, of traffic was not taken into consideration on those. I'm also very concerned with all the water restrictions we have of putting 20, 2,000 or more new residents in the area, what that's going to do to the load on our water restrictions. Um, and the monoliths that are going up at those heights, when the perspective of driving down Saratoga Avenue northbound, today I see blue skies in Mount Hamilton. Now I'm going to see these concrete monoliths. I'd re rather re see it restricted in height a little bit. Steve, please unmute yourself. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for uh, unmuting me. Um, I am a member of Catalyze SV, and uh, I would encourage you to uh, move forward with this project. Um, I think it's a great use of uh, the property. Um, it's got great density, and uh, the fact that it's combining uh, homes with the commercial space is a nice way to um, activate and uh, keep that um, space utilized. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And with that, that now concludes our public comment. We can now move on to item three, I'm sorry, four. The applicant has five minutes to respond to public comment. With that, the uh, applicant, the floor is yours. If, if you could share screen with Allison, please. Great. Uh, Chair Bonilla, Eric Shainauer again, land use consultant to the project. Um, Let's review a, a couple of public policy items that were discussed. With regard to height, uh, since the community brought up Valco, I just want to note that Valco has buildings of 200 feet tall in Cupertino. Uh, someone brought up Saratoga. Saratoga's new housing element um, envisions a 10-story residential project in this neighborhood at Prospect and Lawrence. You can read it on their uh, general plan website. Uh, but with regard to San Jose, the heights proposed uh, on our project are very much consistent and actually less than uh, heights that are allowed in similarly situated urban villages throughout the city. So on the screen, these are adopted urban village plans that the city council has approved. And as you can see, the Stevens Creek urban village plan uh, along Saratoga Avenue, Stevens Creek allows heights up to 150 feet on the large development sites. The Santana Row Valley Fair Urban Village Plan allows 150 feet on Winchester and Stevens Creek. 
The Bass South Baskin Bourbon Village plan allows 150 feet on the larger development sites on South Baskin. North First Street, 200 feet. East Santa Clara Street, 140 feet, and so on and so on. So what we're proposing at uh, 99 feet, 127 feet, 130 feet, and 132 feet are similar to or less than uh, other urban village areas throughout the, the city. Going on to the next question. So how do you design a taller building to be sensitive to the neighborhood? So this is a cross section of our building number two, I'm sorry, building number one, um, which fronts on Quito Road. And to the left side would be the Baker West single family neighborhood. You can see the property line. And then is the existing berm. So there's an existing 56 foot wide berm with mature double row trees along the entire berm existing. We're not touching it at all. So there, there is a solid screen of trees between us and the single family neighborhood. And then you can see the red line. That's the 45 degree daylight plane line. That is a good planning standard for putting taller buildings near single family neighborhoods. And you can see how far our building is outside the 45 degree uh, line. In fact, this building is 215 feet away from the property line. And even at that, we still step the building back. You can see it steps away from the neighborhood. Let's go to the next slide, which is uh, building number two, which is the closest building to the neighborhood. The orientation has flipped. So the single family neighborhood is on the right side now. Once again, you can see the existing berm 56 feet wide with mature trees on top, double row, and you can see the 45 degree plane line. So in this location, we our overall building height is much lower. We've brought it down to 99 feet total height, and we've still set it back 100 feet away from the property line to the nearest point, and then we've stepped the upper levels back away from the building. These designs far exceed the citywide design guidelines for neighborhood compatibility with new taller buildings next to single, single family neighborhoods. Moving on to transportation, just wanted to note that this area actually is fairly well served by VTA bus transit. So the red lines on this, uh, on this map, this is a VTA map, by the way, uh, are frequent service lines, which means that the service is 25 minutes or faster or, or more frequent on both bus route 57 and 26. Uh, route 56 is a local serving line. And then the uh, express route 101 also passes through this area. With these bus routes, you can conveniently get to jobs or, um, or uh, resources in downtown Campbell, downtown San Jose, job centers in Santa Clara and Cupertino, or head the other direction to Saratoga. So if people want to take transit, the options are here. And if we don't put high density near transit, no one will ever ride it. And it will always be a financial loser to our community. With that, Mr. Shane Arrow, we are now at the five minute mark. What I'll do is I'm going to now go ahead and open it up for commissioner questions. However, I will not close the public hearing in order to give staff, uh, I'm sorry, but my colleagues the opportunity to ask questions of the applicant as well. So with that, colleagues, I see that Commissioner Lorna Noah's hand is up, uh, Commissioner Lorna Noah, and then Commissioner Torrance. And I just want to say thank you to all the members of the public that have come to speak tonight, that have contacted us over email. Um, I think this is probably second only to the Google project since I joined the commission in terms of the amount of public interest in this project, both for and against. And so thank you um, for all of that input and feedback. Um, so I've lived in this area myself uh, for the past six years by Saratoga and Moore Park. I spent a lot of time in the El Paseo area. And when I was growing up, I spent a lot of time there too. Um, so this is something, you know, the future of this area is really important to me personally. I've got a lot of question, 
Well, not a lot, but I've got a number of questions uh, for staff about various issues that have been raised in the discussion around this project. Um, so first off, um, a couple different numbers have been thrown around for open space. Um, and I guess for the, for as pertains to the project's parks obligations, um, if staff could just clarify how much park space is being included here um, in this project. Because I think the different numbers going back and forth have been confusing. Sorry, good evening, Commissioner. Zach Mendez here, Parks and Recreation and Planner with their, uh, the Planning Department or the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, I'm happy to provide some clarification on the obligation that the, that the project has. Um, the project is proposing uh, 994 units, and when we convert that into a parkland obligation, it equates to roughly 6.9 acres of parkland. Um, when we convert that to an in-lieu fee, that's roughly $18 million uh, in in-lieu fee that would be paid uh, for that land. Um, the project itself is proposing the 3.5 acres. <coughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I apologize. Uh, the project itself is proposing the 3.5 acres of open space. Um, we are working with the developers still to kind of determine what will be public space and versus park space. Um, that hasn't quite been determined. Um, you know, the balance of open space we think is is good for the scale of the development and the urban nature that's being built there. Um, what will be is it the park space exactly and whether it will be dedicated to the city for ownership uh, and its maintenance is kind of still to, to be determined. Gotcha. And so that wouldn't have to be determined until the certificate of occupancy is issued. Is that how that works? Uh, prior to building permits. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. And then um, any uh, in lieu fees that are paid, that just goes to the city's um, pot for park fees and doesn't isn't necessarily um, tied to any building parks in any particular area, right? Uh, it would be tied to the area of the project. So depending upon the usage and whether it's in a neighborhood park or in a community park, there's a three quarter mile nexus or a three mile nexus. Uh, so the fees would be deposited into the park trust fund and they would remain there for usage um, to acquire land or improve the park land in the surrounding area. Okay, I didn't know that. So thank you um, for clarifying how that works. Okay, um, and then I'm also just curious about, so I, you know, the berm has come up and having visited the area many times throughout my life. I know there's uh, big trees that were built that are on the berm. I believe those were installed when this uh, shopping center was first developed back in the 80s or 90s. And I'm curious, um, what is the total height of that tree line, including the berm? And you know how that, just curious how that compares to the height of the heights in the project itself. Uh, maybe I can defer to the applicant for that response um, from a parkland perspective. It, I'm sure. Not quite sure. Well, did, did you want us to answer now or later? Now would be good, Commissioner Morton Laws. Yeah, now. So I think the best way to answer your question is to show you a picture. Would that be acceptable? Yeah. So, um, Allison, if we can call up the, we have photographs from the uh, adjacent residents' homes that show the mature trees. And we've computer simulated the um, buildings in the images. So this is looking from the adjacent homes. And Allison with the, with the cursor can show you the trees that are on the berm. They're the tall ones. And in most of these images, you can't see our building. She can show you the peak, the peak of our building, right? behind one of the trees. So it creates a great visual screen. But if I had to give you a number, you know, the, the, the trees are probably um, 35, to, between 35 and 50 feet tall, depending on which species it is. And then what's the elevation of the berm itself above like the surrounding area? Um, um, the, the berm is, I don't know, Ken, do you have a better estimate? I'd say the berm is probably about uh, 15, you know, okay. 15 to 20 feet 15 to 20 feet yeah. and it does vary okay 
Uh, no, thanks. That was just some a curiosity that I had um, in that conversation about the role of the trees. Um, okay, and then um, another policy question for staff. So, uh, as has been discussed a lot with this, this is a designated growth area, does not yet have an urban village plan. Um, it was Horizon 3 back when the Horizon system existed, so I assume we're not going to see an urban village plan anytime too soon for this particular area. But I'm curious, um, one of the concerns I've, that we heard expressed was that this project um, takes up a significant portion of the allocated residential capacity for this um, urban village area, growth area. Um, and I'm curious, are those numbers set in stone or is that something that could change when the actual plan is considered and adopted um, in light of this project having, you know, say if this project was approved um, by that, that point, um, how does that work? Michael, see your hands up. Yeah, so the numbers, things have changed with the four year review. So um, the growth numbers that are in the general plan currently really are for the purposes of CEQA um, and aren't, don't necessarily reflect uh, the maximum amount of development that could occur in a given urban village or potentially even the minimum, right? They're, they're generally, um, well, in most, I'd say in almost all cases, you can build more. So um, those numbers have been adjusted in previous urban village plans. Um, so yeah, so if we were, when we do a plan in this area, we would look at those numbers, we might recommend more. We might actually have a plan that could theoretically allow more, but uh, not change the number in the general plan. So there's a lot of different potential outcomes. Now the, the CEQA would analyze only a certain, certain amount of development. And if someone wanted to go above that amount, the, the developer would have to do additional CEQA. Um, one of the challenges that we've had is we don't have a lot of capacity around the city anymore. It's not because we're building housing, it's because we have so many growth areas and a lot of the uh, capacity has been stripped out of outlying growth areas and moved downtown because of Google downtown west, other development occurring downtown and other urban villages. This is, I don't think this village, I don't believe this village lost capacity. It might've lost a little bit. I don't think it did, but um, yeah. So the capacities are um, something that are very uh, malleable and can change, could change. We did actually apply for a grant to do an urban village out here and it was denied um, or we didn't get funding. And it's possible the council could give us money down the road to do something out here. We think it is a good area to do. Uh, a village plan um, because this is where the market would want to build. Um, but right now we don't have funding at the moment. We may get something this this uh, budget year. We'll see. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And then just one more point I want to, I guess a concern I want to raise and a suggestion for being incorporated into whatever our recommendation ends up being tonight. Um, so District 1, which is where this project is, uh, I believe parts of District 6 as well, and I think that's it. Anyways, there's the West San Jose Multimodal Transportation Improvement Plan that um, uh, the Transportation Department is working on, and that allows areas in its boundary to get uh, be eligible for really important transportation improvements that I think would be particularly beneficial in this area were this and other projects that have been just, you know, mentioned tonight were to be approved. Um, but as it stands, the boundaries of that plan include basically none of Saratoga Avenue. Um, and so it doesn't come down to the area where this project is. Um, and given the existing importance of Saratoga and the future increased importance as more and more projects are proposed in this area, I want to ask the commission that whatever we vote on tonight, we also make a recommendation to city council that um, Saratoga, the entire Saratoga Avenue corridor be include or be added to the West San Jose Multimodal Transportation Improvement Plan. Uh, I think that's it for me for now. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Martin Law. Uh, Commissioner Torrance and then Commissioner Ornelas-Wise. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, let me lower my hand. Okay. So, wow. A lot of information swimming around up here, <laughs> I think, for a lot of us tonight. But what one thing that has really hit me in this is the affordability piece, because there have been so many times where we have listened to proposals where the developer pays an in lieu fee, or I forgot how to say that right, the whatever, however we say it, right? They pay a fee instead, <laughs> okay? And I greatly appreciate the fact that the affordable housing is being included right in this project. I am a beneficiary of affordable housing. That is the reason I've been able to live in San Jose, married to a teacher, teach preschool and raise four children because I was able to arrange, arrange a privately private situation and live here affordably. Otherwise I would have moved to Sacramento, but because I can live here, raise my kids, I get to enjoy all the resources and also contribute to the community. So affordable housing is a good thing and I greatly appreciate this and I applaud the applicant for including that right there so that those residents like myself can enjoy a resource rich area at a price they can afford. So, but when you live in an area, you do need parks. So the one concern I have is the small amount of park, of, of park space. So I want to ask, I think this would be for PRNS, is what, in what distance is there green space for these residents, whether that's a school where people can go and take walks, what kind of green space is available, will be available to these residents? Um, if you give me just a moment, I can take a look at that for you. Um, off the top of my head, there are a few park resources that are kind of within the vicinity of the area. Um, Saratoga Creek Park is the one that comes to mind immediately. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, just give me one second to pull up my maps. Sure, take your time. I think the lot that my house sits on is 0.6 of an acre and it's not a very big site. So one acre doesn't seem very large. And I think that's what I've heard tonight for the proposed park. Clarity, Mr. Shane Aram, to come back to you as well uh, to give us uh, clarity on the park space from your perspective as well. Sorry, it's sticking. And, um, that's okay. Are you when you're yeah, ready. Space I, I can also speak to that generally. This is Mario Blanco, uh, environmental project manager. Um, so the nearest parks to the project site include the Saratoga Creek Dog Park that's approximately 0 0.3 miles northwest of the project sites, um, El Quito Park that's approximately 0 0.4 miles southwest of the project sites, Rainbow Park, um, Hathaway Park, which are both 1.4 miles um, from the project site. Um, and these were included under the public services section of the draft environmental impact report. And I also wanted to quickly speak to, if I may, um, to the um, students generated by the project and um, how they would be uh, serviced by the surrounding schools. So students generated by the project um, were analyzed also under public services. And as noted on page 206 of the draft EIR, the project would add up to approximately 363 new elementary and middle school students and add a maximum of 99 new high school students. Um, so in the preparation of the draft environmental impact report, the environmental consultant did reach out directly to the affected school districts and confirmed that they would be able to accommodate all of the students generated by the project. Thank you. Let me also, uh, just because parks have been coming up, let's also make sure, uh, Mr. Shane Hour, if you can clarify that as well, that we're, everyone's, you know, we can yeah, see. So Al Allison yeah. is gonna call up our slide on the open space, just so <clears throat> there's no confusion. Um, and and Zach Mendez from the Parks Department is correct that you know, we haven't worked out an agreement yet. So the exact size of the park is not pinpointed, but <clears throat> on, um, on this exhibit, the bottom left corner is where the, the dedicated public park would be. So we are committed to giving the land uh, to the city, 1.1 uh, acres of land, as well as funding the full construction 
of the public park. So it'll be a neighborhood park like any other neighborhood park in the city. However, we do suggest it should be more urban in character since the, this project is an urban project, but that'll be determined by the neighborhood. The balance of our site is privately owned, publicly accessible space in the form of paseos, plazas, out and outdoor dining. So that's what we are providing. Um, in terms of, I think you mentioned uh, uh, Commissioner Torrens, uh, uh, you know, other open space and schools. Well, right across the street from this site is Moreland Middle School. And they have large fields, they have a track. Uh, so if, if someone wanted a large field or wanted to schedule the school field for a soccer game or what have you, go fly a kite, it's right across the street. And then one block to the east is Prospect High School, which is a massive campus with football fields, soccer fields, softball fields. So um, there is a range of types of open space within the immediate neighborhood. What's needed is the neighborhood park with the playground so that families with young kids can walk to the park and play in the park. And that's what we're gonna deliver. Okay, thank you very thank you. much. Commissioner I, Torrance, is, does that conclude or, or did you have more questions? And if you do, that's so fine. Th those are my questions, but I'll just conclude my questioning here uh, by saying thank you for, for answering those. That does make me feel better, although sometimes those public um, school lands are not always available. Sometimes they'll fence those off, but that's, that's, that's good that there's open space. Um, so that, that is all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ornelas Wise and then Commissioner Young. Hello, um, this, I, I'm really impressed with everybody's passion in this project. Um, I think you've all done a, a wonderful job in, including staff and, and everyone involved. I do have some concerns regarding um, parking given the scale and size of the project and the reduction I saw noted in the staff report, I think it's a reduction in 6.1% of parking requirement for that size. So one of the things that I'd like to see is maybe some sort of condition of approval that would, um, because there's so much shopping in nearby, some sort of like parking agreement so that people could actually use some of the existing um, parking space. And another thing that I saw um, when I was looking at the renderings, I see that it's like a paseo, right? So people could walk and then there's like, um, parking lot there. So one of the things that I'm concerned about is safety that a car goes through that paseo while people are there. So I don't know if there's a way I know like at San Jose State, they have like these um, movable, like concrete kind of thing. So something like that. So just for safety for the people that are there, I'd like to see something like that. I also um, believe that, you know, recreation is really important to the quality of life open space. Um, I was really concerned about um, parks as well. Um, one of the things that I'd like to see, I mean, I didn't know if you had like a rooftop pool, you know, some built in stage on, you know, in the Paseo for like music or entertainment, um, something along those lines that I like to see. Um, I also would like, um, you know, maybe art shows. Uh, pop-ups where, you know, local um, people that make things could go and sell them for, for more jobs for the people and for more enjoyment for the community there. Um, so just different forms to um, create recreation and utilizing that space to its maximum use is something that I like to see. Um, but I do like this project because I think San Jose, it's about time you grow up and not out to prevent ur urban sprawl. I think this is fantastic. This is the perfect example of that. Um, to be an incentive to use VTA and all the public uh, transportation in this in the area, I don't know, maybe you could have like some move in special, um, you know, and, and give people a free VTA pass or something um, to encourage people to actually have a pass to be able to use those services. I'd really like that. Um, and I know that a lot of people are not just using bikes now, are using like these different, you know, skateboards that have motors and all these different type of scooters. Um, and maybe from the neighborhood want to go there, but want a safe place to put not just their bike, but also, you know, whatever gadget they use to get there. So maybe um, like, like a locker or a caged area where people could 
could put some stuff like that. Um, so those are just um, my thoughts and recommendations, but overall, fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Nellis Wise. I'll now go to Commissioner Young and to Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, just a process question here. Um, I do have a couple of questions, but then uh, just to confirm, we are going to have a chance to come back and let the commissioners state their uh, preferences on the project. Is that correct? That, that, to define what you mean by preferences of the project. Well, what I'm saying is um, if we can ask our questions now and then have another opportunity to come back and talk about our actual thoughts about the project before the vote. Sure. Okay, great. And one other favor would be following the questions. Uh, if there any chance we could take a, a very brief break. Um, we've been going almost two hours now, so. Um, okay, um, I have a question for the applicant, um, but there's been a lot of talk about, oh, first of all, uh, I wanted to, uh, I, I did want to disclose, I did meet with both the, uh, several of the neighborhood associations on Zoom uh, last Friday for half an hour. And I also met with the developer uh, on Zoom. So I, I, I think I have a pretty good sense of uh, the issues and the feelings on both sides. And I, I appreciate those meetings very much. For the uh, developer, Allison, if you could talk about, um, a, a lot has been discussed about traffic. And I know there's concerns about the mitigation measures, but what hasn't been mentioned is the work that I believe you're gonna do to improve the safety of a couple of the intersections in the area, as well as provide some additional crosswalks. Could you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. And if it's helpful, it might be, um, if you don't mind, if I can share the site plan maybe, and um, Go ahead. be able to explain that. So give me one moment to be able to pull that up again. So thank you for your question. And I think that as part of our project, um, we are also committed to a lot of uh, site imp uh, off-site improvements and uh, transportation improvements. So um, the enhanced crosswalks uh, will connect our project uh, nicely to the two sides here. Um, and then, um, you know, we've been working with DOT and Public Works uh, for a while, and we've identified Public Works' as priorities and committed as a project um, to helping mitigate those um, areas for public works. Our project was not, um, did not cause a, an unmitigatable VMT impact, but this location right here um, at West Campbell and Hamilton was identified and made known to us uh, by public works and DOT that this is a priority location that they want to improve um, as a VMT measure. And so as part of our project, we will be uh, per, again, DOT and Public Works' um, uh, recommendation, closing this pork chop off, creating an enhanced crosswalk here that allows for the project to connect nicely to uh, the neighborhood back here, Moreland West, and increasing pedestrian crossings, signalize, new signalizations, creating new curb sidewalks, um, and uh, additional, again, pedestrian crosswalks through here and here. Um, similarly, uh, Pork Chop Islands on this corner in front of our project on both project frontages will also be closed off. And in lieu of those will be increased um, raised bike, plant, uh, bike pathways um, and new curbs and um, and sidewalk areas as well. So that, you know, I think that the, the design of pork chops um, when projects come along, um, projects are encouraged and uh, want, projects are trying to encourage eliminations of these pork chops. So as part of our project, all three of these uh, pork chops that are surrounding our site will be um, removed. And clearly a lot of signal um, improvements here, median work to accommodate all the new driveways and walk uh, pathways and crossings will all be improved as part of the project. So a lot of offsite work um, will be included to improve the overall circulation and safety for both bike and ped in the area. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, you know, when we talk about traffic and whether the medic mitigation measures are sufficient, I tend to trust the traffic engineers. I'm not one. And the traffic engineers do say that the mitigation is sufficient. Um, but I, I do want to just point out that this developer is doing safety improvements 
that are really not required for the project. They're doing it voluntarily. And in case you're not familiar with the pork chop terminology, because I wasn't, it's an intersection where drivers can make a free right turn without having to stop at a red. And that's probably one of the most dangerous intersections for pedestrians. So uh, they're eliminating two of those, one of which was the highest priority for public works. Um, just one other comment and question, and then I'll, I'll let Commissioner uh, Garcia speak. Um, some talk has been made about transit and whether this has sufficient transit infrastructure. There's multiple VTA bus lines that run here. Um, including rapid service. So I'm having a difficult time understanding the concerns about insufficient transit here. And I just wanted to confirm one other thing with the developer, which is, I believe you told me that the parking costs are actually unbundled from the monthly lease cost. Is that correct? So could you describe how that incentivizes transit? Yes, if I may. So um, as part of this project, we will have a robust TDM plan as a requirement. And one of the measures in our TDM plan is to unbundle the parking from um, the cost of, uh, you know, uh, the residential unit. So that would work to encourage people because they will have to pay an additional cost instead of having an inclusive parking space. Um, if they wanna have a parking space on the site, they will have to pay extra cost to use that. So those types of measures um, when in place are designed to encourage people to clearly uh, find alternate modes of transportation and hopefully not rely on a single occupancy vehicle. So we will have a lot of TDM measures um, across both the residential as well as the commercial um, users on the site. Great, thank you. Commissioner Yun, does that conclude your questions? Perfect, we'll go Commissioner Garcia and then we'll go Commissioner Montañez. And then I, after commissioner questions, I will take you up on that advice and call for a five minute recess. So, uh, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, uh, Chair Bonilla. I actually don't have any questions. I uh, had a, my perspective, so I'll hold for now. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. Commissioner Montañez. Uh, most of my questions have been answered, but I actually do have um, just two possibly. Um, first one is, what's the distance from 85 to the actual project site? Staff, can, did you hear the question? Hold on, I'm measuring it right now. Ah. Unless uh, someone Half on the council has it. Yeah. Allison, Mr. Shane, do you all have that answer? I, I don't have the exact number and I can do it real quick on a, a measurement right now, but um, having driven that m many times, it's, uh, I would say under, definitely under a mile, if that, um, but I'm just a quick measurement, Allison. It says it's about exactly one mile oh. from property line to um, the freeway entrance. Okay, so easy access yeah. to the freeway. Um, all right, and then my other question was that, and I think the the, um, the public speaker um, made a comment about one of the streets being used as a thoroughway, uh, thoroughway and I think that may have been, they were referring to Elmwood. Um, can someone address, uh, are there any, any mitigations um, being taken for traffic to go onto Elmwood? or any of the stretch of road. Um, and we found that A, the volumes are with it well within the range of what a local residential street can carry, which is around 3000 vehicles per day. Um, the analysis show that currently there's a maximum of 1900, or let me confirm my numbers here, but um, a maximum of uh, 1700 vehicles per day that are currently going through that. Um, through that road. And then we also looked at, we also did a speed study current on that road as well. And right now the speed also is within an acceptable range along that stretch. And so we aren't recommending any traffic calming measures at this point with the existing conditions out there. Um, but you know, we can um, further involve the Department of Transportation to look into some of those concerns that we have heard um, again 
in the future um, regarding traffic calming along that stretch. And then um, I just have a, just a comment. Um, I'm a trans transplant to San Jose um, from Southern California and uh, own a house in Southern California, bought a house out of state, um, have lived in dense housing um, in San Jose the, the entire decade that I've been here now. And um, if it weren't for density projects that exist, um, I think that I couldn't afford to live here. Um, so I, I reiterate the statement that one of my colleagues had made about the affordability. I work for a nonprofit um, and uh, we definitely, I believe, need projects that um, do have higher density. And I think what I really like about this project is that it is on a thorough way. You know, Saratoga is not a small street. It's not embedded in a, in a neighborhood. Um, and so just kind of when I, when, in, when evaluating this project, um, taking those, those items into account is what I, so thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Montañez. Uh, do we have any other commissioner questions? Okay, seeing none, I am going to take Commissioner Young's advice and call for a five minute recess. When we return, we'll deliberate and vote uh, after deliberation. So with that, we will come back at 8.28 p.m. <laughs>
resuming the meeting. We are now at the portion where colleagues, you can weigh in with your opinions. Um, I will also weigh in at the end. So uh, with that. I'm not sure if Commissioner Torrens is back. Oh, is she? I thought she was back. I think we have quorum though, right? Yeah. Fair. Yeah, there she goes. Perfect. There, there you go. All right. So with that, colleagues, comments? Commissioner Olverio. Thank you, Chair. Uh, appreciate everyone coming out and speaking uh, at the public hearing tonight. Appreciate a lot of the questions and comments raised by my fellow commissioners. Uh, you know, we've approved a variety of high density projects the past few years that are um, abiding by the established policies of the city. And we do it to, map, to meet the city's goals of housing production with the limited land that's less to remain to be developed. And we've done so in densities we have not historically done, but this commission has been approving them left and right consistently because it, again, it matches the established goals put out by the city's 2040 general plan where we're allotting for upwards of 400,000 additional residents with by the year 2040, which we can debate whether that will happen or not. But long story short, um, the projects that come before us that have staff recommendations are fitting within what the city has laid out for the, the development community to do. Uh, these developments don't occur by the city actually building projects. They occur through the private developers, as we all know at the commission, but for members of the public that are sometimes uh, maybe fatigued or concerned about what's happening. Um, these, these things have come about through city policies and state mandates on housing production. And so therefore, um, you know, I'm supportive of the staff recommendation. I'm comfortable with the way the staff recommendation is. I know there was a su suggestion about adding something, but that's really the city council's purview to do so. Um, but ultimately, you know, this is a project that doesn't show up overnight. It'll take, you know, I mean, the developer may have a timeline they're sharing, but in my experience, this could up take upwards of a decade. These projects are big. They take a long time to do. Um, we were approving 14 stories in, uh, on, uh, West San Carlos, uh, back in 2008. So we can only expect these densities and heights to increase. Um, again, sorry for being verbose there, but I wanna just put forward a motion to support the professional planning staff recommendation. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second the motion. All right, so motion on the floor, motion by Oliverio, second by Torrance. However, with that, we will- uh, It wasn't Torrance. Oh, I'm sorry. But yes. Oh, Montañez, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Commissioner Montañez with the second. Uh, we now have a motion and a second. However, I do want to recognize that Caballero, Young, and then Laura Denois. Thank you. Um, I didn't ask any questions because most of my questions were asked by our by fellow commissioners and I didn't want to reiterate them. Um, I reviewed this project and um, I have to say that I'm... Uh, pleasantly pleased uh, with it. Um, I think it's beautiful. I think that I have traveled to a lot of other cities across the nation that have these types of large uh, uh, high density paseos, mixed use, and they really make neighborhoods very vibrant and um, places where people congregate and increase um, the economic vitality of these communities. And, and that's what we want to see ultimately in San Jose across the city, not just in downtown, but in a variety of places. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I am as well. Uh, can we put our, let's put our Zoom on mute here. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just, um, I am in support of this. I love the fact that it includes affordable housing. I would like to see more open space, but I'm actually the fact that there's several parks nearby. I think it's near transit and near major thoroughways. And I do think that it makes, um, our community, uh, the additional 1,000 homes um, and, you know, apartments, condos, whatever, really do uh, 
help us meet our housing goals. And so I'm going to be in support of this project. Thank you, Commissioner Caballero. And with that, we'll go Commissioner Young, then Laura Denois. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, I'd like to commend the uh, neighborhood associations, uh, the ones I met with, um, for your positive approach to this. Um, you know, often on the Planning Commission, we hear only negative things about projects, and I want to really commend you, uh, the leaders of the neighborhood associations, on your positive approach to this. And I know how difficult that is. I've I've worked in neighborhood associations, was on the neighborhoods commission for a time, and I know how difficult it is to get consensus. I really want to commend you, and frankly, your efforts have made it a better project. Um, number one, the uh, you expressed opposition to an educational use there, uh, and the developer withdrew that. That's huge. They had a client in mind. Um, so I, I think you can definitely take credit for that. Um, you improved the, the parklands, you improved the safety of the area. Uh, you encouraged the developer to put two levels of subterranean parking um, at a huge expense, by the way, but they did that to provide more open space. Um, I, I think it's a beautiful project um, and I'm gonna support it. And so really then the question comes down to the height of the buildings, right? And this is a this is a challenge we face as plan commissioners because um, no one likes to have tall buildings in their neighborhood. Uh, it's very challenging in San Jose because our major boulevards, where we need to build higher buildings, almost all of them back up to single family residences neighborhoods. So it's tough, and I understand the concern of the residents. But the fact of the matter is that, as some of the other speakers have mentioned, the housing situation in this city and in this valley, it's unsustainable right now. We have such a shortage of housing, and the housing, the rental housing and ownership is so expensive that um, we, are, we are getting to a point where our city will not be sustainable. Why? Because people that work in service jobs, in a hotel or restaurants or retail, and even people like letter carriers and teachers, police officers and firefighters, they can't afford to live here anymore. So we cannot have a city if we don't have those folks here. And the only way we're gonna be able to solve that problem is to build more housing. You know, and to the folks that commented that they wish more of this project was affordable. Um, first of all, I commend the developer for putting the affordable units on site and not paying the in lieu fees. Um, I commend you for that. And also, I think what we need to re remember is building a thousand dwelling units creates affordability elsewhere because the more supply of housing we have, the less expensive housing becomes throughout the city, right? So even though, you know, there's only 150 quote unquote affordable units, projects like this are the, are the solution to our challenge. And, um, you know, our, we have it. We have a general plan. The general plan authorizes the heights that these buildings are being proposed at. In fact, they could be higher under our general plan. So um, I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult for many of us, including me, to imagine our city changing and getting higher. And But I think if we want to remain a vibrant, healthy city, welcoming where people can live, we need to build higher. We need to build more dense. So. I'll be supporting the project, thanks. Commissioner Young, thank you. Commissioner Rodinois. So um, I agree with a lot of things uh, my colleagues have said so far, I'm not gonna avoid repeating um, they said, um, but you know, just going back to, um, you know, I know a lot of the concern around this project has had to do with the amount of affordable housing in it and with how this impacts park space and access to parks in West San Jose. And I know I've talked a lot about how District 1 has fewer parks than any other council district. It's certainly a huge issue in this part of town. Um, and But when it comes down to it, um, that's an issue with how we regulate development. Um, this project and any project 
have to meet the requirements set out in our ordinances. And so, uh, you know, this project does meet its affordable housing obligations by providing 15% on site units. Um, it will have to, in one way or another, meet its parks obligations. So, while, you know, I guess what I'm saying is, our role as a planning commission is to vote on whether a project follows the rules or not, and it does. And so, uh, but definitely the parks issue is really important. It's just, this is what's required by the ordinance, and so that's what the project is doing. Um, when it comes to just the project itself and the size of it, this is underutilized land. This is, and, and it's been like that, you know, my entire life, it's been underutilized land and it is along Major Street, Saratoga Avenue. It is near Highway 85 and Lawrence Expressway. Um, as Commissioner Young said, it's difficult to build something in San Jose that isn't near a single family neighborhood. Um, but along major thoroughfares are where we're supposed to do it going by the general plan. And so um, this isn't easy to do this kind of development infill because, you know, people are used to the status quo, but I think it is important that we be pursuing this um, kind of development through our growth areas. Um, and then you know, going to the traffic issue, that was why earlier I emphasized that I think it's a really big hole that the West San Jose Multimodal Transportation Improvement Plan doesn't include the Saratoga area at all. And that's the transportation improvements that could come with this area being part of that plan would be important for mitigating the impacts of this project and for other projects that are being considered, you know, both along Prospect and Lawrence and nearby in Saratoga. So I wanna offer as an amendment to um, the motion on the table right now to recommend that city council expand the West San Jose Multimodal Transportation Improvement Plan to include all of Saratoga Avenue. I recognize that this is not specific to this project, this is not specifically a land use issue, but it is just a recommendation and I think it's something important for council to pursue to address the whole situation in the area that this project is a part of. So putting that motion on the floor, that amendment on the floor. So request for an amendment has been made. Uh, will the maker of the motion accept the request for amendment? Well, Chair, um, thank you. I believe that it would determine be make a, a friendly amendment, but I think Commissioner Laudernois has just simply stated, I wanna make an amendment to the motion. Uh, well, I mean, I wasn't being specific. It, would that be a friendly amendment? Uh, so if you're asking if it's a friendly amendment, I would consider uh, language such as the city should consider. But I would say recommend is even stronger because I don't know all the particulars of that program. And unless planning staff tonight can present the merits of that program, and I understand it, recommending it is difficult, but considering it is something to consider. Uh, but I'm sure there are other parts of the city that are facing uh, developments such as this that may desire it as well, but I don't know the limitations. I don't know uh, really much about that plan enough to say, you, I recommend it because consider it is fine. That's what I would work for on language. Yeah, I am not particularly picky about consider versus recommend, so. So are you then clarifying to state that you would like to make a friendly amendment with the word consider uh, within the amendment? Yes. I accept. Okay. We have to ask the seconder. Uh, yeah, I was about to do that. When, with that, I will ask uh, Commissioner Montañez. Just a real quick question. Would it be more, um, would it serve us better to send it back to transportation so they could look it over and then they can make the recommendation or consideration to the city council from a perspective of process. You have and I mean, I'm just yeah. gonna say, I know that transportation is what that plan is under. I just, I don't know what 
I mean, it is their work. So for me, it's, right. you know, that they're, the, yeah. they're the, the committee that has the, ex, you know, that this is what they work on. And so if we're going to send it anywhere, I would probably send it to, it. I mean, if there was a planning issue that was, you know, that another committee was um, recommending to go somewhere, I would like them to recommend it to come to the planning commission. So out of respect to the transportation commission, I would probably say we should send that part to the transportation commission. Okay. So Michael, you've got your hands up, your hand up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's hard because DOT is not here tonight to speak to that. I know a little bit of the origin of the multimodal improvement plan that exists. Um, so they're not here. I mean, you could make a recommendation to consider and then DOT um, would be at council to sort of respond um, with uh, a response to that, rec you know, rec consider recommendation that you have, whether like that's something we can do or we plan on doing that, but through another process or whatever that may be. So they would likely be at planning commission and they, they could, I mean, I'm sorry, city council and they could respond there. Alternatively, you have to sort of put the request of the DOT and they have to respond to you guys at a, at a different time, which you could do too. Um, but I think saying just putting consider for now could be okay and uh, let DOT respond to council. Yeah, yeah, I would be okay with consider um, for now, um, sending that to council. Uh, would you be amenable to that, Commissioner One thing yes, still or? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay, so then we'll, we'll then Commissioner Oliver, just so we're on the same page, and the amendment is to Commissioner Lardner. Why don't you restate it now with right. your language? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess uh, for City Council to consider um, amending the boundaries of the West San Jose Multimodal Transportation Improvement Plan to include the entirety of Saratoga Avenue. Is that amenable to you know, the maker of the motion? Second. Uh, yeah, that's fine, Chair. Okay. I'm fine with that. Perfect. All right, perfect. Thank you. And then, Chair, just on that yes. question, if I may, for planning staff, when planning commission makes a, uh, a motion and has a consideration of a different policy of a different department, um, would you be inclined then to, in the staff report that goes to city council, to have comment from that department on that item from the Commission, or do you, or to your point earlier, just have them there and answer the question? It, it depends. If there's time in the memo, we'll, we'll have DOT respond to that in writing. Sometimes there's not time. I'm not sure what the turnaround on this is, in, but but it would be addressed in our presentation. So we'd have a slide on it, and DOT would speak to it. Great. Thank yeah. you. Sure. Yeah, thank you everyone for entertaining this. I think it's really important. And I, but I acknowledge it's different than um, something we don't often do. So thank you. No, no, thank you. Commissioner Torrance. So my uh, quick comment is I'm super excited now that I heard that there could be 333 students coming from this project with the affordable housing and just having dense housing because our schools do need kids. We don't want all the kids leaving San Jose and going elsewhere because teachers need kids to teach, to have jobs. So that got me extra excited and I am definitely in support of this project tonight. Thank you, Commissioner Torrance. Do we have any other comments from colleagues? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and weigh in. Um, I'll be honest, you know, when I first read the packet, I liked what I read, I liked what I saw. Uh, you know, I'm over here in District 5, the east side where you know, I'm craving these types of uh, big picture investments. Uh, but out of fairness, when I saw that there was a lot of community commentary, I did take it upon myself to, to connect with the neighborhood groups as well as the developer. Uh, and I think in the conversations that I had, it became pretty clear to me, and I don't wanna minimize anyone's concerns because I understand it's, it is your community, that very often every Wednesday we run into the same concerns and the concerns are often out of that you know, for lack of a better word, that fear of your neighborhood being transformed overnight. And I think Commissioner Oliverio stated it quite eloquently. Uh, the, these types of projects take at least a decade to, to kind of see some real movement. But even within that movement, though, uh, these are exactly the type of projects that I envision happening throughout the city. We are the largest city in the Bay Area. We are a city with a limited amount of space for housing. Uh, undeniably, we're not just building housing here. We're building community space, um, similar to what someone said earlier, 
Santana Row had a lot of opposition, and now Santana Row is, you know, a very, very uh, important social place for this city. Uh, you also talk about the fact that uh, we we are creating some vibrancy uh, that, in my mind, uh, can can help further uh, become a, a contagion for the rest of the city. Again, back here in the East Side, wanting projects of this type. But I think what, what really got me, uh, it's consistent with uh, you know something I talk about very often when I sought the appointment of planning commissioner, that I wanted to see more affordable housing integrated into projects because very often we do have two San Jose's. And what I like about this project is that it's one San Jose. It is literally a mixture of socioeconomic backgrounds in one. And to me, that's really what makes a city, you know, uh, a, a, a major, not just destination, but a, but a cultural leader and that is, for me, uh, something that I was really, really impressed by, because it's easier to say, here, I'll write a check, call it a day. It's a very different statement to say, we're going to build the affordable housing into the project and make it a part of this community. So, uh, again, I wanted to be fair to the community. I wanted to be fair to all parties, and I did meet with everyone. But my conclusion, and again, I don't want to minimize, I think the Commissioner Young's point on the community side, great work. Uh, your work has gotten probably not what you want to hear from me right now, but nevertheless, great work, your work, your advocacy got you here. Uh, and there's still a lot of conversation to have, right? Because as we all know, in, in, in this space, things change, markets change, uh, ideas change, and you know who knows, right? But I think where we are right now, project-wise, it's something I'm proud to support. It's something I'd be even prouder to have in my side of town. Uh, it's something that I continue to talk about and encourage and want because there is some value in creating not just economic vibrancy, but that people vibrancy. Uh, and that's something that to me, uh, this project hits on the mark by making a very clear statement that for those of us, and I am a product of affordable housing and I grew up in public housing. And you know, this isn't public housing, this is a mixture of affordable housing within market rate. You want to talk about changing lives, that changed lives right there. That, that, that belief that you're worthy to be a part of this uh, to me is something that really stuck out and something that I, absolutely want to support and I, and I will go back to, to show you all that I do listen to public comments someone I think from Catalyze SV said look in my community we've got drug dealers and you know we'd love for this you know I'm not going to say that about my community but I will say that in my community we are starving for economic uh, investment in, in this type of vibrancy and energy uh, so it is again a question of perspective and for those of us on this side of town that don't get these opportunities it's an amazing privilege not to say that your concerns aren't valid but it is to say that we do have to recognize that we are one San Jose, the largest city in the Bay Area, and this is how we're going to get ourselves out of the housing crisis. And this is also how we're going to continue moving in the direction of being a worldwide epicenter, which I know we are and can be. So with that, I will now go ahead and call for the vote. All right, Bonilla, yes. Casey? Yes. Caballero? Yes. Cantrell is absent. Garcia? No. Lord and Watt? Yes. One thing, yes. Yes. Oliverio? Yes. Ordelas Wise? Yes. Torrance? Yes. Young? Yes. And with that, the motion passes with Control being absent and Garcia voting no. Okay, with that, we will now move on to item B, PP22-002. With that, staff. Thank you, Chair. Aparna Ankola. Aparna, thank you. With the policy and ordinance team, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Staff has a very brief, brief presentation today. Um, hey, Aparna, just a second. Um, Chair, can I thought we were going to go back to consent calendar. Do you want to do that after this? I will. This? I'll do it after this. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'll do it Thank after you. this. Thank you. The item before you today 
is a proposed amendment to Title 20 of the San Jose Municipal Code, also known as the Zoning Code. Staff routinely updates Staff routinely updates the zoning code to incorporate changes such as technical or formatting edits to ensure consistency. This proposed update will reinsert and readopt previous city council approved changes that were inadvertently not published, partially published, or overlapped with the subsequent zoning code update. For three specific items, and will also rectify one typographical error. Staff would like to note that no new changes or edits to the zoning code are proposed in this update. This update proposes to amend specific items in chapter 20.30 residential zoning district 20.40 commercial zoning district, 20.50 industrial zoning district, and 20.75 pedestrian zoning district. Staff would also like to note that planning does not control publishing process or timelines. In order to eliminate future publishing omissions or errors, staff plans to proactively work with the third party vendor to promptly correct any errors or omissions, and also set up a centralized database of code updates for staff to closely monitor overlapping publishing timelines. Staff would like to note that file PP20-009 was approved in May 19, 2020 and it amended several chapters in order to update the city's density bonus ordinance and to also implement the ministerial approvals. This update will reinsert the partially published text only in chapters 20.30, 20.40, and 20.75. I would also like to note that file PP21-003 uh, was approved in December 14, 2021. And this was to extend the applicability of city density bonus initiatives. And this approval would also reinsert the text in chapters 20.30.840. This is um, the Senate bill changes. Sorry about that. That's okay. And the next item, which is the item three, uh, these are again amendments to general plan text approved in December 12, 2017. And these would establish the criteria for commercial support. And the proposed changes only include changes to the section 20.50.110 which is to update the commercial support users. And staff would like to again reiterate that apart from these three um, sections, there are no other um, additional amendments involved with this update. This concludes the presentation and staff is available for any questions. Thank you, Aparna. Uh, we'll now take, uh, do we have any public comment for this? Doesn't seem like we do. All right, seeing no public comment and hearing that there's no public comment, I'm going to go ahead and move on then to uh, commissioners. The floor is yours. Any questions, motions? Make a motion to approve. Second. All right, motion to approve by Lauren Noir, second by Oliverio. All right, with that, let's go ahead and take a roll call vote. Bonilla, yes. Casey? Yes. Caballero? Yes. Cantrell's absent. Garcia? Yes. Lord Noir? Yes. Montañez? Yes. Oliverio? Yes. 
Ornella Swise. Yes. Torrance. Yes. Young. Yes. All right, with that, the motion passes with Commissioner Cantrell being absent. Okay. All right. So, tell me when you're ready for us to go to the consent calendar conversation. Commissioner Lugario. Chair, Chair, I guess the question is, is if there's anyone to speak on the consent, any consent calendar items and to take those speakers, I believe would be the next step. Yeah, no, no, for sure. But I wanted to hear from from council uh, to clarify what it is that we're redoing here. Okay, <laughs> yeah, so well, let, let's clear up any confusion. So I think there was some confusion with respect to whether or not members of the public could pull items from consent. That's not something that they're necessarily entitled to do, but under the Brown Act, members of the public are permitted to comment on the entire consent calendar, at least, at least once. And my understanding was that individuals wanted to speak on the consent calendar, and they were not provided that opportunity to do so. So the way to cure that defect under the Brown Act is to revisit the items on consent, mm -hmm. allow for public comment if anybody is still available to speak. And while we're at it, um, since we are revisiting those items, uh, there was an abstention, Chair Bonilla, by you uh, with respect to the minutes. However, there, sure. uh, there are two other substantive items on there that uh, you are uh, required under the bylaws to vote on. So if you wanna abstain from the minutes, uh, you would need to, um, uh, handle that separately and abstain from that vote. Alternatively, you're not required to abstain from the minutes. Um, even though you weren't present at the meeting, you could still vote and approve the minutes. Okay, that sounds perfect. Uh, Robert, was there anything on the in the record that needed to be clarified, uh, corrected? Yes, uh, oh. so the uh, lady, I think her name is Jill Bordes. She indicated that there was a staff omission on the minutes, which had to do with a gentleman by name, Andrew Matilda. They commented on the same issue or the same project that will be coming before you on June 8th. But uh, I admit it's a staff error. Uh, we captured Jill Borders' comments, but did not uh, include uh, Andrew Matilda. So that's what she pointed out in the letter that she sent. So uh, we coordinated with, uh, city attorney's office and Mark indicated that you can make that amendment and approve access. Okay, so we can make the amendment to the minutes to incorporate those comments? That's correct. And that's the comment okay. from Andrew Matiota. Andrew Matiota. Regarding the guest rent property. All right, so we make a motion for that. Matiota. Okay, I'm sorry, Commissioner Garcia, go ahead. So while we're amending the minutes from uh, last time, uh, there was some question marks on the roll call, right? So uh, to clarify for myself, I was absent at the five o'clock study session. I was present at the 6.30 planning meeting. And that's where there was some confusion there. That's probably why there's the question marks. So um, just wanted to clarify that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for that. And Commissioner Oliveria. Uh, yes, Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes with the comments added by Robert Manford and the uh, comments made by Commissioner Garcia. So we have a second? Second. All right, second from Torrance. All right, so with that, we're going to do 4A. But first, we're going to do the public comment, right, Council? All right, so we'll go ahead and open up public comment. Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> All right, we'll open up the public comment. I think it's Jill Borders. Thank yeah, you. Me. Yay. Um, hi, I'm here. And I'm really grateful for um, all of you and your patience with me. And um, you, I, I just have a lot of faith in this system a little more than I had at the beginning. And I'm, I'm, I am grateful to all of you for doing this. That was my comment was going to be that um, could we 
please make sure to include Andrew Mattiota's um, comments at the 6.30 meeting, which were omitted. So thank you for doing this. It, it really means a lot to me personally that we are taking the time to correct this error. And to all the people that I emailed and got responses back, um, thank you to the people the, you know, that have made this happen. It, it's, I, I appreciate it. So uh, the second thing I wanted to comment on was on item B, and I'll just be really brief. So I received a, a mailer, uh, you know, one of these mailers in the mail to let me know about a public hearing. And two comments is one, we're spending a lot of money on these mailers, right? And it said it, said it was going to be an item and that we could speak on it. But have me having knowing that it's on looked at the thing and it's on the consent calendar, that's why I sent something and said, hey, wait a minute, you've spent all this money to send this out to people in the public and then you put it on the consent calendar, which chances are they're not going to get to speak. So I asked them, would I have a chance to speak? And I was assured that, no, yes, you will. We uh, allow people to speak on the entire consent calendar, and that didn't happen tonight, and that's okay. It's all learning, all a lesson in learning. I know that that has changed. So my comment is that if we're going to spend money, taxpayer money, to send these mailers out, we might want to already have it on the agenda where it's not on the consent calendar because people are expecting to come, and they don't know the rules, and they're going to think that, you know, they're going to be able to allow to, to comment, and then, as of co course, I wasn't. It was very frustrating. Um, since has been resolved, so it's fine. And in the interim, this two hours that you guys, over two hours that you've served the public, and I'm grateful. I did my own research on this development and found out what and type 21 ABC licenses, which I did not know before, and I'm quite comfortable with them selling off sale alcohol. So that's it, and thank you again very, very much. Thank you, and thank you to our council for helping us untie this shoe that I'm convinced somehow I may have nodded myself too. So <laughs> with that, Commissioner Oliveria. Oh, just a question for staff, Chair. Uh, staff, I believe applicants pay the cost for the mailings of notifications. Is that correct? That's correct. It's all inclusive. I want to clarify for the, uh, for the constituent. So thank you. Perfect. All right. With that, we'll go ahead and take a roll call vote on fight item 4A. Bonilla, abstain. I was absent. Uh, Casey. Yes. Caballero. Yes. Cantrell is absent. Garcia. Yes. Lord de Noir. Yes. Montañez. Yes. Cluerio. Yes. Ornelas Wise. Yes. Torrance. Yes. Young. Yes. Motion passes with Commissioner Bonilla abstaining and control absent. Perfect. Can I? Now get a motion to approve items 4B and C. So moved. Caballero with the motion. Second? Second. Torrance. All right. Bonilla, yes. Casey? Yes. Caballero? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Ordenois? Yes. Montañez? Yes. Oliverio? Yes. Ornelas Wise? Yes. Torrance? Yes. And Young. Motion passes with control yes. being control being absent. I got you, Commissioner Young. We kind of <laughs> I'm sorry, who was the, was there a first and second on 4A? Or yeah. was that, that remained the same as um, before, which was Torrens first, Oliverio second? No, 4A was uh, Laura, Oliverio with a motion and second by Lord Noir, was it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Casey, do you have a question? Yeah, Chair, I just wanted to make sure we weren't supposed to give public comments for the BNC. There's someone in the queue that has their hand up. Just clarifying whether or not you know what we'll go ahead and do some public comment how about that all right do we have public comment on items four b and c backtosh please unmute yourself and identify yourself hi my name is backtosh um apologies i didn't know that it was going to be approved as a package deal but anyways um the business that uh, regarding 4C, uh, it's located within a residential apartment building, and the business applicant is in close proximity to other businesses currently selling um, beer and alcohol. 
Um, across the street from the apartment building or the business is uh, our house is recovering from drug and alcohol um, addiction. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out for um, item four in the uh, staff, um, I don't know what it's called, the staff memo, um, it says that approximately 5.7% uh, of the sales area would be um, used for sales of alcohol. Um, I visited the store and it was well over 50 to 60% um, of the product of the store was filled with alcohol bottles. Um, so the business has previously applied for a liquor license and was denied by the city. Um, they've been illegally selling uh, alcohol without a valid license. Um, the, the business owner was told by the city uh, code enforcement and um, alcoholic beverage control to cease sales but um, sales still continued. Um, so I'm just asking if uh, the planning commission can help deny the application because of the lack of following the law and whatnot. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, no more public comment. All right, with that public comment is closed. For sure. Oscar, please unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Oscar Villalobos, and I'm the system manager for uh, the Chevron on Bird Avenue. Uh, and uh, I disagree with with the plan because the plan will create more problems in the neighborhood for the residents and the businesses by creating easier access to the part alcohol for homeless from the area. It is also too close to the low income building that houses many drug and alcohol recovery residents. And it's too close for the other businesses that also sell alcohol. And the business will create the crime rate, uh, will increase the crime rate in the already high crime rate area where there's like no police officers patrolling right there. And then when, they're, when there's emergencies and they're called for emergencies, they show up late if they show up and don't take the police reports. So just having the hard alcohol there in the neighborhood is just going to be even worse. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? All right. Seeing none, we'll now go to item seven. Referrals from city council boards, commissions, or other agencies. Staff, are there any items here? I don't have anything. Okay. None. We'll now move to item 8A, report from city council staff. Is there a report from city council? There is, yeah. So um, North San Jose went to council last Tuesday. The planning commission recommended the council approve a whole series of things, general plan amendments, changes to um, the eight, the traffic impact fee zoning ordinance amendments to basically a retired North San Jose for, pro for pro new projects coming forward, the council went forward and approved uh, the planning commission recommendation. I'm glad, I'm glad they're yeah, taking notes. I'm happy, but <laughs> <laughs> glad they're they taking also, They also uh, uh, approved a settlement with the city of Santa Clara. There you go. Good. I'm glad they're taking notes from the planning commission. That's that's gratifying. <laughs> All right. Uh, 8B, subcommittee formation reports and outstanding business. I don't have anything is uh i don't i yeah i don't have anything on that no, anyone else perfect. all right seeing none eight c commission calendar and study sessions i don't have anything to note on that either all right with that the public record commissioner torrance Thank you, Chair. Is this where we share like happy news? Is that that part or is that later? No, that's that's now. That's now. But you, you I think you're going to beat me to the punch. So go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Wait, what are you going to say? I, well, maybe I, you I, say the same thing. Yes, go I think ahead. we maybe. I wanted to take this moment to uh, recognize and congratulate Commissioner Torrance for finishing a very intensive pro uh, program over at San Jose State University, while also also being our colleague and also living life. It's quite an accomplishment. Uh, I think you're what, two or three days away from graduating? Graduate tomorrow night, 7.30 so, p.m. Tom tomorrow night, she graduates tomorrow night. Quite an accomplishment. Uh, totally, totally 
you've been a great addition to this team. That spirit uh, and that spirit to continue growing is inspiring as well. Uh, not just for me personally, but for those that are watching as well. So congratulations, really happy for you. Uh, and uh, that's what I wanted to say. But uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. I appreciate it. I'm not going anywhere. I get to be in person <laughs> on the planning commission um, in a starting in July. So I'm, I'm here. I'm here for it. So thank you very much. Uh, right on. I know. Was that what you were going to say? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wasn't going to congratulate myself. I was just going to tell you what I've been doing for a year. <laughs> yeah, no, I wanted I wanted to share it for sure. <laughs> any any other public record? All right, with that, my friends, have a great night. See you in the next one. See you later. Bye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>